call this meeting of City Council to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? I'm here. And I believe uh, Councilmember Siemens will be uh, joining us in a little while. And I'd like to just make uh, two comments. Um, the first one, I just wanted to uh, let people know that uh, we're scheduled for a shorter meeting than usual this evening. There was a, uh, an item on the agenda uh, up until last week. We were going to have uh, a report from and discussion with the Health Services Impact Committee and they requested that the item be pulled and they needed more time and since that was only a week ago that uh, made it a little hard to uh, slide some things into the agenda so that uh, we're going to meet with the city attorney at the end of this meeting rather than our usual uh, method of late which has been any of those kinds of uh, administrative function sessions or closed sessions that we do them before the meeting this evening we're going to do it after the meeting so this should be a shorter meeting than usual and the second item is I just wanted to note that uh, I heard from a couple of people today I'm not <coughs> sure whether they were all linked in ways that I don't understand or whether they came up with the same thing separately uh, a number number of them had the idea that it would be really nice for Tacoma Park to have an inaugural ball and I thought that enough people contacted me and thought that would be a good idea that uh, it's probably worth pursuing and I was going to put those people in contact with one another and I wanted to let everybody else know that if you're interested in working on something like that um, I guess for the moment contact me and I will try and put everybody who's interested in touch with one another so that's all I have for the council comments. Looking to the right this evening. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Robinson. Okay. Um, I've gotten a couple of uh, uh, pieces of feedback about the proposed um, um, leaf blower, gas leaf blower ban that was brought to, to us a couple of weeks ago. And um, I'm aware that a, a good path is to consider that ban and other items that might um, relate to our reducing our energy footprint or our pollution footprint to, to consider those all um, kind of in a parcel and I'm looking forward to that discussion probably as I understand um, early next year at the same time um, I've been thinking about this uh, for some days and, and observing folks who use leaf blowers it's leaf blower season of course and raking season and I raked um, our yard uh, yesterday when I got back from uh, a trip to New York City and uh, when I was there I saw somebody using a leaf blower um, used it for a long time for a very small area uh, of, of grass and I guess I guess I'm really I, I, I really wish we could ban leaf blowers or gas leaf blowers in fact all two cycle engines in in the city of Tacoma Park because they're um, really the worst offenders of gasoline engines and they uh, it depends on where you look to find the data but uh, they pollute uh, some people say 300 times as much as uh, four cycle engines and, uh, and and automobiles I don't I wonder if we'd have the police power to go around and and enforce such a ban or the uh, or the um, the willingness to impose such a ban and so that's why one reason why I'm looking forward to the uh, to the discussion in January. Um, at the same time, there's nothing like a, a good old, a um, little bit of good old uh, muscle power to get move leaves around when you need to, and using a rake. So um, I'm even considering uh, putting some whereases together. Um, whereas we're in a time of uh, uh, environmental um, crisis, some would say, and whereas uh, using a rake is good for you, and um, and so forth that uh, that we that we promote the use of rakes now that's kind of an easy way out but um, uh, just this is kind of I'm just kind of putting out my train of thought right now uh, I don't want us to lose track of the the reason why the proposed ban on leaf leaf blowers um, two cycle leaf blowers is out there certainly there's the noise but there's also the um, the pollution and, and it's a balance that uh, I think we should we need to be aggressive on in some way or another 
so that we make the point strongly and and uh, and get it get it right out there. So um, I just wanted to make those comments. And if I can just follow up on that for a second and uh, advise my colleagues that there's if there's any information that you would like staff to gather uh, in preparation for that session on uh, that request for uh, banning of leaf blowers, which uh, will probably be in the second half of January, uh, if you can get those requests to staff sooner rather than later, and then they can uh, refine whatever information that we need. Other comments? Council Member Barry? Yes, uh, some good news. Uh, Saturday's newspaper, The Washington Post, in the metro section featured a beautiful photograph of Sligo Creek uh, in the full autumnal glory uh, and the caption saying something like, you know, beautiful fall in Tacoma Park. So I don't know if the property values uh, inched up as a result of that publicity, but it was certainly nice to see. Uh, and they didn't make fun or tease us, which, uh, of course, is a common occurrence. And there wasn't a leaf blower banner or a fagwa connoisseur in sight. Maybe they were under the bridge, uh, but it was a beautiful photograph and very good press for the city. Uh, and I, I like the idea of a ball, but a ball seems a bit too snooty uh, for Tacoma Park, so maybe we could call it a, uh, uh, a community celebration. Uh, to welcome the president, uh, the new president. Uh, but I think a ball might be, you know, it's kind of exclusive, has a connotation of exclusivity, which is not necessarily in keeping with our more uh, democratic, you know, reputation. Okay. Councilmember Wright. Uh, three items to mention. Uh, first, I would just say maybe we could call the bash instead of a ball. Um, and just that I'm very excited and enthusiastic about our the new administration that's coming and um, feel like we now have someone down the road from us that uh, whose thinking is maybe a little bit more in line with our thinking about how government should work and the role of government. Um, the second I want to, thing I want to mention is just Petco lights continue to be a problem. Um, and I think it's just not fair that basically what Pepco has done is failed to put together a decent reporting system on lights um, that works for people and that there's a follow-up process and a way for them to measure their performance and say the job they're doing. So instead, the city spends its resources and effort to chase around after Pepco to get the lights back on. So um, I think we need to take further steps associated with that. So I would like the city staff to sort of look into what our options are. Should we be talking to Senator Raskin and David Hickson in, in Missouri and suggest that they propose some sort of legislation that would hold PEPCO accountable? Do we need to be talking to Doug Gansler in the Attorney General's office about um, enforcing some current law that's on the books? I'm sure they're required to, to uh, have a maintenance process. So something needs to be done to sort of break this log jam around PEPCO and so that the city can stop spending its resources on um, keeping track of which lights have been fixed and, and following up. And also, for that matter, Council Member Urban's office can stop doing it as well. And then the last thing I wanted to comment is also on the leaf blowers. Um, I feel like there's, at least in the listservs and the conversations I've seen so far, there's sort of ban or no ban. And that's kind of what what's happening where people are at. And I think that um, there's, a way, there's ways that we can deal with the, the main two issues that I've heard. The first is noise, and we have a noise ordinance, so we should look at whether that noise ordinance is covering the, this issue. If it's not, maybe we need to adjust the noise or ordinance and make sure people know how to get it enforced. Uh, and then the, the second is environmental. Um, and I started to do a little bit of research, and I would hope the city staff could, could follow up on this and do more, but other municipalities have started to deal with this, and some of the ideas out there are um, things like banning leaf blowing between May and September when people aren't really using it to clean leaves. They're using it to sweep away dust or debris. Um, or um, there's also seems like there's been some improvements in um, the technology and the engines and the, um, what sort of particulate they let out. So um, maybe it should be that we have something phased in that leaf blowers would need to be of a, after a certain period of time. In the future, they would need to be of a certain 
to meet the certain um, standards of the of the government. So a newer leaf blower would have to be pur purchased. I'm not a fan of a ban because I just don't think it's practical, um, in particularly in the short term. And I think that uh, I'm not sure what you're going to do in terms of all, like Bruce has said, all the large institutions. I'm not quite sure how people are going to be able to hire um, uh, landscapers to come in and, and clean up their yards if that's what they choose to do. Um, because I think basically um, <clears throat> they just won't come if they're, if they're forced only to use rakes as an option. So I think there's a lot of creative solutions. And what I'd like to see from the city staff are sort of what are all the options of what other municipalities have done. I uncovered a few just with a few minutes of research on the web. Um, I'm pretty confident we can uh, find some other things that will um, mitigate and deal with a lot of the environmental issues. And really, there are much larger environmental uh, opportunities out there um, that we can commit to as a city. And then the last thing is I think there should be a big chunk of what Dan was alluding to, which is basically education about telling people what the options are and what the impacts are. And, and hopefully many people would make the choice to use a different method. Council Member Clay. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to be back with you guys this week. Well, <laughs> Thank please you. stay. Nice. I am. I'm going to stay for the whole meeting this time. <clears throat> so um, for those of you who don't know, I got, I got sick at the last meeting and carted off to the hospital and have a, a small electrical problem with the uh, with, m with my heart, which apparently is a, they said it's not a bad problem to have. It is, it is fixable. Um, uh, but uh, it did make my heart race for quite a while, and I had, a, I had an interesting week this week while I was trying to rest and recuperate. Um, so thanks to everybody who, who called or sent me a note to say, uh, get well. It worked. Um, so uh, leaf blower. Um, I'm actually not opposed to a ban on leaf blowers, but um, I don't think that's the place I would start because I think there are, I guess there are, there are other things that we could address um, where I would agree that the technology is probably better. But, um, you know, one thing that I would say is that this seems like a, a perfect opportunity to uh, engage some of our, our young people and employ some of our, our young people with a, with a rake brigade. And um, maybe that's something that we could we could look at doing. I know in, in, other, uh, in other cities where I have lived, they have had um, uh, like kids, youth business incubators. Um, when I lived in Oakland, the kids from Castlemont High School ran a coffee stand at the airport. And um, they had some other kids who <clears throat> developed a, um, a, a lawn mowing and, and um, we didn't have as many leaves there and lots of pine needles. but. Uh, lawn mowing and, and other uh, landscaping activities. And the, um, they had a, a, a youth business incubator that ran it. And I think it initially started with CDBG money and then in some places got picked up by REC and some places got picked up by um, the schools and, and worked relatively well. And there's a, there's a few things I think we've noted in the city that might be good for some youth engagement, youth, youth business activities. And, and this might be one. Um, <clears throat> So when I was thinking all week long about what were the sort of things that caused me stress that I could jettison in my life, I thought um, the, the, one of the issues is that this ongoing invasive growth issue around Boyd Court. And uh, so I guess what I, what I would like is to maybe have a meeting with the city manager and the public works person and maybe someone from planning there and look at Boyd Court and then the Elm Circle issue all at the same time. I could do it in the morning, almost any morning you wanted to, um, like between 8 and 10, or I could do it at the end of the day, um, or I could take some time off of work and come back in the middle of the day if that was what it took. But I would just love to clear these off of my plate and have a permanent solution so I don't have to bring them up every week. Um, I think that the Elm Circle traffic has gotten a lot better. Uh, but there are definitely some regular uh, violators that you see in the early morning and in the evenings. And occasionally, someone who's so dumbfounded when they get to the circle that they slam on their brakes as if they'd never seen a traffic circle before. And I have to tell you, I grew up in a town where there weren't any traffic circles, but um, the first time I saw a traffic circle, I was not so confused by it that I couldn't make my way around it. So um, I also think that 
and while we're there, I'd like to look at the signage and maybe actually painting some arrows actually on the, on the asphalt. Go this way um, to help the few that are still violating because they're confused. Um, I love the idea of inaugural ball. And I have to say that after you guys laughed at me about whether or not there would be spontaneous partying and or rioting in the street, as I was laying in my bed watching television, because that was all I could do on inauguration day, or on, on election day, and I watched the spontaneous party occur at, at, uh, at the, outside the White House. I thought, okay, I wasn't entirely crazy. Uh, it just didn't happen in Tacoma Park. But it did, did it? Yes, it did. Yeah. And we had a march from down Maple Avenue and yeah. up Philadelphia. Wow. See, I was really Carroll. out of it all week long. Wow. Yes. All right. All right. So I'm not insane. Great. And not all of us thought you were insane. <laughs> I love the idea oh. of inaugural ball. I don't care if we call it a hoot nanny or a hoedown, um, uh, or but but I, I think there should be a dance floor. I want there to be a dance floor. Um, so that's my two cents on the inaugural ball, and I'd love to help out. Um, there's continued interest in my ward from uh, around a youth council, and um, I talked about this when I first got elected, and didn't. We didn't go too far with it because we kind of wanted to see where things were going. But there seems to be some other interest in the city and doing some more work with teens and youth. And um, I was wondering if if the city manager could tell us what it would cost if we had like a once a month youth youth council here, maybe in the council chambers before the council meeting or something, um, where we could actually get um, some some staff support without it being, uh, you know, something that is overwhelming. Um, so if we if we did it maybe on a night when everybody's here already anyway, uh, see what that would cost. I would be interested in knowing what that cost. Um, I, I, an applause for Public Works. Uh, I got a notice this week that the Pepco lights that we ordered, I don't know, a year ago, we asked Pepco to do a, a – uh, a cost estimate so we could have some lights installed at the corner of Ethan Allen and Elm, an additional light on one post, or maybe better lighting on one post because it was a really dim light, and then an addition, a new light in a place where there had been a couple of muggings and some teenagers um, engaging in other activities because there's essentially no no light there and other kinds of odd activities going on with this strange dark, dark patch on Elm, and they finally got the bid back from Pepco, which then allows us to give Pepco $4,500 to install the lights. And it only took a year. But thanks to Public Works for continuing to dog that and get us some lighting for that area. And then the last thing is um, I thought that, that we had everything to install a crosswalk at Jackson. And as, um, as, as a, at crossing at Elm and Ethan Allen is becoming more dangerous and we had a right on bus driver actually charge at one of my constituents and the police came out and took a police report and I called right on and I think he called right on um, right at that I know isn't it amazing it just blows your mind doesn't it um, that people don't realize that a giant bus is um, is a lethal weapon uh, so um, anyway I've been encouraging people to get off at Jackson and take the lovely walk through the neighborhood because there's actually a stop sign there, but a crosswalk would be even better. And I know the SHA agreed to it, but we were waiting for our concrete people to do the final concrete pours, which I thought were done. So if those are done and we could get the crosswalk installed and I could encourage my people in my ward to, to get off at Jackson and walk through the neighborhood instead of making that dangerous crossing at Ethan Allen, that would be great. Councilmember Snipper. <clears throat> Thank you. I just have uh, one quick question. Um, concerning the WSSC work, um, I know a lot of us have <clears throat> commented on this in the past, and uh, I, I do wonder if we could get an update on, particularly on Sligo Creek Parkway, which is quite a major thoroughfare of just exactly what the what the schedule is. In addition to, of course, lots of other streets around Tacoma Park, but those are more neighborhood issues than citywide issues. Yeah. Yeah, there was actually an email inquiry, I believe it was, um, from the mayor um, over the weekend. And please correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor, but I believe the public works director indicated that she had checked with WSSC and it was probably towards the end of the calendar year. 
and it was going to be at some kind of a, they've, they've hit rock, and there was some other problem, and it's, the project is going to carry, it's going to finish at about the end of the calendar year, but not have not final determination, and then it'll carry over into the spring. What I will do tomorrow, Council Member Snipper, is um, just take the excerpt from the email and send that to the Council because it has much more detail that I'm recalling yeah. off the top of my head, but I'll get that out to you tomorrow. Ruben, you had a nice geyser on your street the other day when I drove by. We did? We did? <clears throat> one, of the, one of the interesting things that the WSSC is discovering is if they don't repair the pipes fast enough, then the breaks in the pipes that they're not repairing, um, which is what happened on our street, we had... Um, They'd re the place that they were repairing, they're busy repairing, but there was a break a little bit farther along. <laughs> uh, anyway. Councilmember Stevens. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was going to comment on leaf blowers, but I think we've covered that sufficiently for tonight. Uh, just wanted to mention that uh, the U.S. Postal Service uh, has, again, after a couple of years ago, they had announced they were going to remove post off outdoor post boxes uh, from street corners. Uh, they, um, after we signed a petition and did some lobbying with uh, some of our federal legislators, uh, they left them in. Uh, again, I guess they've announced that they're going to be taking them out. Uh, and I, I see that Norman Ridgway is in the audience. He's been uh, circulating a petition and gotten quite a few signatures, which uh, we're now ready to forward on to Congressman Van Hollen's office and uh, Senator Raskin and, and County Councilwoman Valerie Irvin to see if we can't get some help again uh, because the post office uh, or the post box at the Franklin Apartments is especially uh, needed by those people who are seniors and disabled and unable to, uh, to really uh, find an alternative. Um, Councilmember Clay mentioned a youth council. Uh, I would uh, like to call to her attention that the Tacoma Park Community Action Group has partnered with Campfire USA and uh, about 30 other organizations to uh, hold a youth forum that's uh, going to be held in the beginning of the year. Uh, and one of the outcomes of that could possibly be a uh, formation of a youth council. I think it would be a, a group that, um, that Council Member Clay might want to talk with to see how uh, they could help to bring the young people together. Um, and then lastly, uh, I've had a number of people come to me about what are we going to do to celebrate the inauguration, and so I fully support the uh, suggestions that we've had that Tacoma Park do something, and I would also be willing to work on that. So thank you. Councilmember Robinson, do you have a follow-up? Okay. Um, then we'll uh, move along to uh, just a brief agenda scheduling update. As I noted earlier, the uh, Health Services Impact Committee presentation that was originally scheduled for this evening uh, is delayed. I'm not sure when that's going to be. Um, Next week, next Monday, we have the uh, discussion of the bids for architectural services for the renovation of this room. Um, the following Monday, the 24th, uh, we have a work session discussion of city committees. Uh, we originally had tentatively both city committees and uh, the council grant process, but at this point, uh, it looks like we're just going to do city committees. So we have a couple of items that were originally scheduled for this month that we'll uh, hold until next year. Uh, and then we will be on break after the uh, meeting on Monday the 24th, which is the Monday of Thanksgiving week. And then the council will be back in session after the first of the year. Uh, the next item is adoption of minutes. And we have before us... Uh, Minutes from October 6th and October 13th. Would somebody like to move their document? Move. Second. I'll let the clerk sort out who said what there. Um, all those in favor of the uh, adoption of the minutes, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Um, next item is public comment. We appreciate it if you could uh, keep your comments to three minutes. And I'm, I'll just note at this point that uh, I've been uh, <coughs> fairly 
flexible in, uh, in asking people to wrap up their comments, trying to make sure that we hear what everybody has to hear. Um, I think at this point I'm going to be a little more, a uh, little, little tighter on my uh, asking people to stay with the three minutes, and I will do that for everyone, so treat everybody fairly, but uh, just let people know that uh, I'm going to uh, jump in a lot sooner than I have been. So uh, with that, Hello, Mr. Lovelace. my name is Pat Lovelace, 7620 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park, Whitehall. <clears throat> I want to uh, thank everybody for coming out to vote, and I have never seen such a uh, voter turnout that I, that I have on uh, at the uh, middle school up here at uh, Piney Branch. There were, there were lines going on for, 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 for seemed to be for blocks. People couldn't wait to register their vote. And it felt so good to see people out there doing that. I also want to thank uh, Terry and Joyce Siemens for uh, helping people in our building, Franklin Apartments, to be in the other areas, to be getting back and forth to the polls. There must have been over 100 people from our building, I heard, that got out there to vote. And it's, uh, it was so great. So, uh, also, uh, also, I uh, wanted to, uh, an idea I have for uh, the uh, inaugural balls, I think we should call it the obama Jama. You know, to call the clock obama Jama. Yeah, and, uh, but uh, it says on my shirt, you know, what does it say here? Uh, yes, we can. Well, I think we should change it to, oh, yes, we did. Because a lot of people have finally got up and, and used their, uh, their uh, activism to show that we can do it when we have to do it. You know, that's what activism shows we, we can do. You know, and I think it's a really great thing to, to, uh, to, to remember that next time we have to vote. And also, I think we should be getting everybody out there who hasn't registered the vote yet to register to vote. So we can do the same thing year after year, month after month. So we can keep our government where we want it, you know. And uh, the uh, another thing too is, just because we got Barack Obama in office does not mean we have we can just sit back in our laurels and say we did it, because it's not done yet. We still have people on the streets. We still have a, a, an economy that's tanked down the toilet. We still have a war that's raging uh, like a twenty alarm fire over in the Middle East, and we still have a you know, what a trillion dollar debt. That we have to work on, so we still have a lot to do yet. Just because we've got Obama in, that's just one step in the right direction. We've got to continue on as activists to get other people active and other people aware of the world around them. If we can do that, Tacoma Park can lead the way, and I think we can do it. So uh, yes, we have not done the job yet, but we have shown that we can do it. And yes, we can. And yes, we did. So. <laughs> And I, when I finally get down to see uh, George Bush packing his junk up and getting out of there, then I'll be happy. Okay, well, I think we should tell everybody that's the importance of voting. We did it, we will do it, and we will do it again. And Tacoma Park will lead the way. Thank you very much. And yes, yes, I think we should try to keep those mailboxes in. One idea I have of moving the mailbox of Franklin Apartments inside the building lobby so that the elderly people don't have to walk on the ice to mail their letters. Thank you very much. We will rule. Peace will rule. Thank you. Yeah. There's somebody else who would like to make public comments. Now sit down again. <laughs> Good morning. Okay. If there's nobody else, the next item is the uh, city manager's comments. Okay. Uh, two brief items. Um, at your places at the dais this evening is a copy of the... Um, City's continuity of operations plan, often referred to as a coup by Chief Rikuchi, had shared with me that several council members had expressed interest in seeing the document. Uh, so he had asked that I forward that to you. Uh, the only other item I have is just to note that the um, bids for the auditorium project for the design services were received today. We received seven bids uh, for architectural services, and staff is in the process of reviewing those. Um, and we'll have more information for the council next Monday. Sounds like. Uh people are interested in finding work. That's right. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. We'll move to the first item on our regular meeting agenda, which is a uh, resolution regarding the purple line. Um, <clears throat> if, would somebody like to introduce that and we can discuss it? Move. 
Moved by Councilmember Rick. Second by Councilmember Robinson. Cat was up here grabbing tongues. <laughs> um, if I can first just point out the main parts of this agenda. There are a lot of whereases, but I'm going to just note the a couple of the therefores that give the sense of this, uh, which is that we urge the state to proceed with the submission of the full length of the purple line to the Federal Transit Administration and to work for the funding and construction in the near term. We urge the Secretary of Transportation to select the medium investment light rail transit option. We urge acquisition of sufficient right-of-way along University Boulevard to enable the future installation of wide sidewalks shaded by trees and buffered from traffic. We urge the use of grass tracks in areas such as Tacoma along the crossroads and Long Branch. Those are in the middle of the right-of-way. And finally, we urge consideration of the through right-right-right turn intersection design to minimize the width of University Boulevard and New Hampshire Avenue at the uh, crossroads. So that's the main gist of what we have on the table. Are there any comments from the council? Yes. Councilmember Barry. Yes, good evening, everyone. And Suzanne, thank you for coming. Uh, one uh, important constituency in my area, the Crossroads Development Authority, um, which, uh, if uh, very forthrightly, uh, supports the purple line, uh, but raised some concerns uh, that were maybe getting a little bit ahead of the uh, trolley car. Uh, and uh, their specific concern was is that some of the whereases go beyond uh, the mere uh, support of the uh, mode of transportation itself and venture into areas that members of the CDA and the uh, non-city sanctioned uh, entity that has, has been created recently, the uh, X Roads uh, Group, uh, feel um, encroaches or impinges on uh, areas such as the right-of-way acquisition that are still a matter of some debate uh, and concern or um, multiple perspectives. And so uh, bef before I can support the resolution as it's currently presented, uh, I'd like to give uh, those folks an opportunity to um, point out specifically uh, their concern with the draft uh, as presented, and then to have you, Suzanne, uh, if you will, respond to those concerns. I think that would be a, a good way to begin our discussion uh, tonight and would be very enlightening to the rest of the council. So how would you like to proceed? Uh, Irwin could come forward is, is that, uh, if that uh, is appropriate. If or? I can just find out if there's any other council comments at this point, and then we can take uh, public comment, and then we'll have a chance to uh, come back anything we need to. Councilmember Brink. I just had uh, one question to sort of fully understand the right, right turn. Mm -hmm. So you're, instead of being able to go across, you turn right in and there's a loop back through? Basically, you, you drive across the intersection and then you turn right through the, around the block. And so then you go back through the intersection and, um, in the direction that you're You go all the way around the whole block? It's, or it's, like, it's like a little... Well, it depends on, on how that gets designed, and that's still to be worked out. It's, it's, it's essentially, it's, it's, yeah, it's essentially a at-grade cloverleaf design, but on regular blocks, so that the object is to not have one or two left turn lanes in each direction, which then you've right. got that extra 20 feet or 25 feet uh, of uh, road width. I guess I would be a little concerned if, well, two things. If it's a true block and then you're driving a lot of traffic down into neighborhoods, I'd be a little concerned about that. And then the, if it's if it's just a, a cut through maybe in the front of someone's parking lot, I would be concerned that that actually creates another roadway that a pedestrian has to traverse. To, so right. The, uh, I, I'm not an expert, a traffic expert, those are, but those yeah. are sort of my two logical concerns. Sure. Um, those are things that um, certainly has been looked through with the sector plan meetings. Um, the concept is that you're not cutting through a parking lot and having an extra crossing, but that is um, either around the blocks that exist now, which primarily are commercial on the edges, um, or 
especially as redevelopment occurs, that it's appropriately designed so that it's a commercial edges on both sides so that you're not having negative impacts on residential areas. Right. You know, that is very important. Um, I don't know that I, given your suggestions, Councilmember Berry, I'm not sure that I want to go into yeah. the details right now. Why don't I relate, listen to the other comments, right. and then I'll go through because I, there are some points that I'd like to raise about that. Great. And then the second point I just wanted to make is, you know, people have talked about the difference between the cost of the light rail versus the BRT and okay. have suggested that there isn't that much of a difference and um, in terms of travel times. And so I, I, this is my math. I looked at the, uh, the numbers that are here, and these are the latest numbers provided by the MTA. Assuming. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at from Langley, you know, Tacoma Langley to Bethesda, the BRT is 31.9 minutes. If you look at the light rail, it's 25.2 minutes. So it's a 6 .7, you know, 6 7 or 6 minutes and 40 second difference, um, which is, you know, it means the train's going to be 25% slower. To me, that's actually pretty significant. Um, and I think we'll, we'll uh, makes a significant uh, decrease in the quality of the experience. And, and uh, I mean, the ridership numbers bear it out, but it just seems to me worth it for the extra money to actually truly have a fast way to get across. Yeah. Okay. And if I'd like, and, and if you uh, don't mind, the, not only is that the case, but the interspersing of the buses with regular traffic means that if there is a traffic congestion problem, that will be a much longer difference. Any other comments from the council? Council Member Stevens. I uh, thank you for uh, all the work you put into this. Uh, resolution, and I um, uh, certainly support the purple line as uh, the council has fully supported, I think, unanimously in the past. Um, and I'm really encouraged that the new administration at the federal level uh, may certainly put greater emphasis on uh, this type of transportation as opposed to the roadways. Uh, although I, I would have to uh, agree with Councilmember Barry that uh, it may be premature to include some of the uh, commitments to specific designs uh, that haven't uh, really been vetted with the public yet. And I'm, I'm prepared to, d to talk about that, but I'd like okay. to wait for the other comments. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, is there any public comment on the proposed resolution regarding the purple line? Okay. Erwin Mack, Executive Director of Coma Lane Crossroads. Mr. Mayor, City Manager, Council Members, it's not possible to live within the three minute limit given the extent of the huge investment of time, monies, but I'm privileged to represent some $200 million worth of commercial investment, not only in Montgomery County, Cold Park, but in Prince George's County, and at the intersection of University and Riggs Road. I had left before you a, one, a single sheet, which I'd like to read into the record, and I will do so rapidly, and then we can engage in discussion should you wish to do so. Number one, there's no significant objection to a light rail purple line by anyone. Two, there's a significant concern about the threefold involvement in the crossroads by A, MTA, the purple line sponsors, B, sector plan by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission of both counties, C, SHA roadways, because of the obvious inconsistencies of the proposed use of roadways, sidewalks, landscaping, and the intrusion on existing commercial properties proposed by those three entities in the immediate, near, and distant future. Three, being concerned about these inconsistencies caused the formation of the X Roads Committee. That's an X with the word roads behind it. Call the X Roads to distinguish this group of property owners managers from the existing crossroads property owners managers. The X Roads Committee represents all the property owners managers having commercial interests in the actual crossroads in both Montgomery County and Prince George's County, as well as significant property in the proximity of University Boulevard and Riggs Road. Four, 
The inconsistencies mentioned above caused the Exroads Committee to request a special meeting with representatives of the three entities for the purpose of strongly urging that they compare notes, as it were, and bring their stated differences together so as to permit the Exroads owners' managers to relate to a consistent proposal. Five, the Exroads Committee expresses its concern about the lack of communication by the staff of Tacoma Park to the members of the Exroads in the preparation of resolution number 2008-XX and therefore respectfully strongly urges that the specific items to be mentioned will be deferred or set aside until such time as responsible discourse can take place between the staff of Tacoma Park and the Exroads members. Six, mention is made in resolution number 2008-XX of support for various plans as though final decisions have been made and accepted by the Exroads property owners managers when no such support has been recorded. Seven, it must not be left unsaid that there is a willingness on the part of the Exroads members to carefully consider the values proposed by these three entities, yet recognizing the legal and financial incursions made on them. Finally, there exists a puzzlement as to the need to bring in so much of the sector plans into this resolution, when much work still needs to be done to bring about a consensus that can be supported in the main. Therefore, the request to set aside those specific points itemized until further discussion can be had between city staff and the actual property owner's managers. Specifically, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I have these to be marked on your sheets, which unfortunately are not numbered 1 through 10 on each sheet, but I'll refer to the specific items on each page. I have the six pages in front of me. Page 1, no exceptions as of this time. Page 2, if you count from top to bottom, points 10 and 11. Point page 3, however, all points 1 through 10. Point page 4, points 2, 4, 10, and 11. I can repeat those, and I'll be happy to share this with Ms. Ludlow afterwards. Page 5, none as of this time. Page 6, points 3, 4, and 5. In addition to the record I just presented, I was given the ask, actually asked to make a presentation on behalf of a property in Prince George's County, which is part of the X-Roads, and I will share it as you have it there because there are some unique points being made. The need for more parking referred to in the draft resolution, whereas is clauses at page 4, will be further exacerbated if the state goes forward with its current transit center design. The current design calls for removal of 97 of the 419 existing parking spaces at the Langley Park Shopping Center. <coughs> this is the shopping center where the Taco Bell exists and where the transit center is intended to go. The state does not plan to replace a single one of those spaces and also is providing no space where transit riders can be dropped off or picked up. Additionally, the shopping center will lose significantly more existing spaces if it is forced to install on-site traffic controls to keep transit center riders and bus drivers from parking their cars in the shopping center parking lot. There is no on-street or public parking in the area to accommodate these lot lost parking spaces. We strongly, and this is the owners of the reliable properties at that shopping center, we strongly oppose the therefore paragraph number three proposal at page six calling for acquisition of additional University Boulevard right-of-way. Additional right-of-way on the north side of the University would cut through our anchor tenant Rite Aid store and would also bisect the proposed transit center. Prince George's County Planner, Aldea Douglas, has previously stated that if additional right-of-way were to be sought, it would not be pursued unless an individual property owner sought to redevelop its site. We have also been advised that Montgomery County does not want any further expansion of the University Boulevard right-of-way on its south side of the road. Tacoma Park Planning staff was in attendance at both of the recent meetings where these statements were made. There is not enough information available to support the therefore paragraphs numbers 4 and 5 recommendations at page 6, promoting the use of grass tracks, in quotes, and a, quote, through right, right, right design of the University of New Hampshire Crossroads intersection. Neither the mode 
design, nor final alignment and stop locations have yet been chosen for the purple line. Also, the state has not yet responded to how the intersection design would affect its proposed transit center and travel bus travel times. In the absence of this crucial information, we do not support either of these two recommendations. I'm honored to bring these concerns to you in the spirit of collegiality and wishing that every good thing could happen, not only in the city of Tacoma Park, but specifically at the crossroads, which desperately needs such reconfiguration to bring it into a, a sense of identity which it has been missing for years. And I'd be pleased to make myself available at such time or to request the city staff to meet with the members of the X-Roads who would be delighted to take such time as would be necessary to cover the points of expressed that are of concern. Thanks. Is there other pub public comment? Hello, um, I'm Laurie Kelly. I live on Grant Avenue in the city, and um, I've been a member of uh, Purple Line Citizens Committee, and I've also attended the um, community workshops. And I mainly want to speak to the need for the Purple Line, um, light rail versus express bus. Uh, the, first of all, the majority of the working class people living in the whole Tacoma Park area do use um, public transportation. Most of them use metro bus, regular buses, which are slow. And sometimes they have to transfer, take two or three buses to get where they're going. The Purple Line would, um, would allow commuters to travel west to Silver Spring, Bethesda, or east to the University of Maryland or New Carrollton. Um, what would be faster about the Purple Line train is that the trains will probably have dedicated lanes uh, versus the bus having shared lanes. Okay, also, Purple Line is much cleaner for the air, the water, and the soil. The Purple Line will bring a Tacoma Langley Transit Center, which has been much needed for many, many years. Um, I started with concerns of pedestrian safety, getting riders off the street um, because they cross mid-block. They don't use crosswalks. They just get on or off the bus wherever the bus stops are. And there are eight major bus stops um, around the crossroads on University and New Hampshire. Okay, the Purple Line will have three stops nearby, um, Long Branch, University Avenue, the Crossroads with New Hampshire, and also, not far away, Crossroads with Riggs Road. Um, just addressing what you were discussing about parking, I don't know if parallel parking is in the plans, but that could somehow replace maybe some of the shopping center parking lot spaces that are lost. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Is there other public comment on this resolution? Okay. Um, Suzanne, yeah, do you want to address some of the points that have been raised? Sure. Um, I guess the first thing I'd like to say is um, I've worked on planning projects for many years, and some of them have been these very long drawn out planning processes that take many years. One of the things that's very difficult for people, I think, is to recognize the point where it goes from a concept plan to something that's a little harder, uh, a little, uh, something that's a little more firm. And we're, we're at that point now. Um, the proposals, the information that's been put out by the Maryland Transit Administration identifies six build alternatives and then two other alternatives that they are required to look at if they don't build a purple line. Each of those alternatives has cost estimates. It has fairly detailed information in the background about how much land would need to be taken and how much construction would need to be done for these various options. And um, we're at the point where a recommendation as to one of which of these six alternatives is best needs to be made by us to go forward to the Maryland Transit Administration and the other bodies that, that um, make comments on it. The, um, one of the things that 
I did have a chance to talk with Mr. Mack this morning uh, at length, and I appreciate the concern that we're talking a good amount of detail about right-of-way widths and that kind of thing. And it's not measured out, but there is quite a lot of detail in the whereas clauses of the resolution. And that information is to try to do a couple things to protect the city of Tacoma Park. The first is, under the proposals that are included in this document, uh, the amount of right-of-way that is proposed to be used for University Boulevard is probably a bit too narrow to be able to have comfortable sidewalks. We're talking, you know, five-foot sidewalks uh, you know, very close to the curb on University Boulevard. And that's simply not a comfortable environment uh, alongside essentially a highway. And, um, and it's not the kind of thing that we have envisioned in terms of having really healthy commercial shopping mixed-use area around a transit center, something that's attractive, something that's walkable, something that's usable, something that people will come to for. And so we've looked at what is the right amount for the pedestrian access. In addition, uh, in some segments along University Boulevard, there's these access roads that go along parallel University Boulevard, which are often used by park for parking. Um, what some of the options that MTA has proposed, especially the bus rapid transit options, would remove any way for parking along the curb um, in off-peak times. We've found um, for a healthy economic <laughs> development district that it's very useful to have some off-peak parking available near commercial businesses. When on the flip side, we don't want to have too much land taken away from the shopping centers. And so one of the things that's been, uh, I think, very proactive of the folks who've been working with the sector plans are thinking about what can be done to keep the right-of-way on University in New Hampshire to the smallest walkable uh, amount while still keeping the um, shopping center whole and keeping a healthy pedestrian a wide enough pedestrian way. Um, the proposal that has come through in the discussions has been this um, scheme to do the through right, right, right um, intersection, which hasn't been completely sketched out in terms of how it goes around, but the concept, which is that we basically prohibit left turns at the intersection and have other ways to facilitate um, good traffic movement at the Tacoma Langley intersection. Um, is important so that we can minimize that road width. And that's why this is here. Now, it's true that we're at a point where we're, we're trying to decide which comes first, the sector plan or this plan or whatever. I think that it's uh, the right thing to do to be proactive to say from the Tacoma Park's perspective for what makes us kind of the healthiest community in many different ways, what's the right amount? and that give that direction to the state. Uh, uh, the um, CDA and the X Roads Committee is right that they have been looking at plans that, you know, three different kinds of measurements of what, of what University Boulevard is. And as a property owner, I can imagine that that's distressing. You're trying to figure out your financial uh, impacts and that kind of thing. But rather than wait and, and react to something after it's been adopted by the Secretary of Transportation, uh, I think that um, it does make sense for the city to make a recommendation as to what would be the best thing for the health of our community. Um, and that's why this information is there. Uh, it may, you may wish to alter how those things are stated or not include them, but I do think that um, to not have that information ends up being harmful both to pedestrians and to our property owners of the shopping centers. Um, which I think both will lose um, in terms of coming up with the right amount of land that is reflected in the plans and in the, f and in the financial estimates that go forward to the Federal Transit Administration. When the next step of this, if the Secretary of Transportation picks an alternative and says, yes, we're moving forward on the purple line, is to identify how much money the state is putting forward. And so they're going to come up with fairly detailed cost uh, proposals and show what, this, what the contribution is from the state. So it's 
it feels like a concept plan, but it's not there. It's, it's really kind of moved into this next stage. And um, our comments at this point are important and have weight. Um, I really appreciate that I get calls from the Maryland Transit Administration staff and from Montgomery County officials wondering what our position will be. I said, well, we'll share it with you when we get it. But clearly there is interest because we are a key portion of the Purple Line route. Um, and we will have a large benefit from economic development. And a variety of sources are looking at this area as one of the prime reasons for having the Purple Line in the first place, is the Tacoma Langley area is a tremendous beneficiary of a Purple Line. And that's part of the selling um, of the Purple Line to the larger community. Uh, just a couple other things I want to mention. Um, there are tremendous environmental uh, advantages to having Purple Line. Um, as I've gone through these reports, the numbers of vehicles, and especially vehicle miles traveled per day, they get taken off the road with a light, medium investment light rail. It's really remarkable. And I just imagine how important that will be to the health of our community and our region. Um, the grass tracks, you know, is a healthful and attractive uh, aspect also of that. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking about as I looked at this was that uh, a number of years ago, the Tacoma Metro was built and the impact on the livability of Tacoma Park really increased. Uh, it uh, serves many of our residents. Uh, it's increased property values, especially Ward 1, as quite a beneficiary of the Tacoma Metro. And I think about how nice it would be to have a, that benefit for Wards 5, five and 6 um, and the interconnectedness uh, for our whole community. Um, and I think that it would be a real shame if we weren't pushing hard on this um, to help our economy and our livability kind of over the long run in Tacoma Park. Um, just to um, reiterate some of the information, there's a series of public hearings um, this month. Uh, Mayor Williams um, scheduled to testify on November 22nd at the hearing at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus of Montgomery College in Falcon Hall at 1 p.m. And uh, we'd be preparing testimony based on your direction uh, for that hearing. And if you can just say a little bit about uh, what, I guess, what the uh, course of action is after those hearings. You may have done that a little bit, but what I want to do is get a sense of we weigh in at the hearings, but then there are other opportunities for comment as the process goes forward. The, um, the public hearing comment period for these alternatives is until January 14th with the Maryland Transit Administration. And so you can email or send letters to the Maryland Transit Administration. We have that information in a variety of places, how to contact people. Um, and, and if we had uh, further comments or clarifications, well, we can the, always the, do that, but let me just go the, through. But this, are you talking about the public record is open until? The public record is open until January 14th. Okay. Now, the importance of uh, the testimony on November 22nd is that it then goes to the Montgomery County and Prince George's County Planning Boards. They're making their comments and doing their studies uh, to submit their comments. Um, that information then goes to the two county councils which will make their comments to the MTA as well. Um, we have found in the past that we're most effective when we're in at the beginning level so that the various planning boards and county councils can incorporate our comments. Um, and uh, we don't have to do that, but it is, tends to be the most effective way to be part of a larger effort. Um, I know one of the things that uh, Councilmember Leventhal has made a big point of is that we do need to stand strong um, across Montgomery County on the Purple Line. And so he's been urging very strongly that there be a lot of cooperation among the various parties um, so that there's a strong end statement to the Maryland Transit Administration. The Montgomery County Council will be getting their comments in late January after the January 14th um, comment deadline. 
simply because they can't get it before then, and the Secretary of Transportation has said he would wait for their comments. Obviously, it's very important. Um, so there's a little bit of wiggle room. Nevertheless, the Secretary of Transportation has said that he would make his decision in February or March of 2009, and then it goes very rapidly if it's to proceed uh, to the Federal Transit Administration in spring. So that's the schedule. Thank you. Questions, comments? Um, we'll come this way. Um, Suzanne, I'm trying to envision the right, right, right um, in going all four directions. And have you given thought to that, given I mean, for traffic going all four directions? Yes. I mean, it does. All four quadrants do work in that regard. Okay. And, you know, I think that one of the objects, of course, is that the whole, that the properties on all four quadrants get redeveloped so that they're more kind of transit friendly and walkable and so even though they would work pretty much as it is now they would work better as redevelopment occurring I see I, I mean an example is you're going west on new on university and you would then and you want to go south on New Hampshire if you're coming from the University of Maryland you want to head towards the district you want to make a left turn but Instead, you'd go into the parking lot. Uh, you'd go kind around. Of the, you'd go around. around the you'd go on Lebanon Street. You'd go around the backside of of Rite Aid and around, just like the way the buses Big go. Block. Okay, you wouldn't go through around the transit center that were built. No, so you would forth. not. Okay, just trying to get clear, yeah. clarity on that. Yeah. Thank you. And if I can just add on to that, mm -hmm. is is a, I would imagine that a potential benefit of that to the businesses is that it gets more traffic to those businesses well it does and it and it all people see them you know from different sides um, the advantage in redevelopment is that you don't just have businesses facing out towards University or New Hampshire but you've also got businesses facing towards Lebanon Street or whatever other street has made the arrangement for that roundabout so that you end up with um, a healthier um, viability of variety. It's the 100% corner kind of concept. You've got multiple ways of, of reaching and going directly past uh, businesses. Suzanne, do, are those some, I just had a follow-up question related to that. Are, there sometimes, uh, are those sometimes used only during peak hours? Do people, or is that too confusing to, to people? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I th the only times I've seen them have been as a permanent version. Uh, unless you've got the overhead sign indicators that are lighted that can be changeable, and I think those sometimes are tough. If you think about this intersection with a light rail train going through the middle, having people taking left turns in front of it and that kind of thing, starts to, I think people would understand at that intersection why left turns are difficult. And, it's, you know, so I, on that particular intersection, I can see this working. I don't normally recommend this. Because, you know, people do, you know, it, it takes a lot of, it does take a lot of uh, configuration. But on this particular intersection, it does make sense. Okay. Did you have a question? No. Very, yes, how many cookies are in the package? <laughs> yeah. Is what he seems to be concerned about. He <laughs> doesn't want to take the last one. Um, I, I do think that we have a, uh, a chicken and egg uh, problem here or... The, uh, the cart before the trolley. Um, and I think that uh, we would probably be safer at this juncture if rather than to get into the specific recommendations, we looked instead uh, at articulating some principles. Mm -hmm. uh, the first principle, it seems to me, is pedestrian safety. Uh, the second principle is uh, enhancing the commercial district. Uh, and the third principle is making sure that uh, everybody is talking to each other. And the, the X Roads uh, Committee is relatively new. I only learned about it on Saturday, and it seems to me it's an important group because uh, these are the major property, property holders as well as the secondary property holders. And I, I can't uh, see how we would be successful at this point if you've got these folks erupting uh, up and down university in that part of New Hampshire because they feel that they have not been uh, properly consulted or there are right-of-way and other kinds of issues that they uh, 
uh, would find uh, not uh, in keeping with our principle of enhancing the commercial area. So I think that uh, by strongly uh, supporting uh, the Purple Line right, uh, light rail, uh, we accomplish the main goal, which is to go on record uh, with that support. But uh, I think at this point we would be better off if we avoided the specifics, um, realizing that later we can weigh in uh, up to January and maybe beyond uh, once the, uh, the businesses have had a chance to catch up with the process. Uh, and then I think the second important point here is that Tacoma Park uh, play uh, even more so its uh, traditional strength, uh, which is to act as a catalyst in bringing the entities together. We have no money of our own. Uh, at least not this point to contribute, but we, we certainly have ideas. And since it's happening uh, in in our most uh, important uh, business district, our largest one and the and the one that generates the most property taxes, we have a uh, vested and important interest here. Uh, and to make sure the two counties and that the state are um, consulting with the uh, with these new the new business group in particular, but also with the uh, established one. So uh, I, would, I would prefer at, at this point, and I would encourage you and uh, my council colleagues as well, to go for the more general principles rather than the specifics at this point, and to redouble our efforts at bringing uh, all of the business entities and the government partners that we have together to make sure that everybody's fully informed and fully on board. We may not always agree <coughs> on every point, and I don't think that should be our, our ultimate goal, because maybe we will our views may diverge from certain aspects of the business community and even some of our partners. But uh, I think it's important to explore those areas of agreement as well as articulate the, or the uh, areas of disagreement as we move forward between now and January. Councilor um, Clay. Well, I support the Purple Line, although I think that uh, bus rapid transit is uh, more cost effective and more flexible. Unfortunately, it's hard to rally as much support for the for the buses um, as it is for the light rail. People like to ride on the trains. But um, I guess I, I would agree that we would move forward with general principles. I mean, everyone likes the idea of the train except the people who have it in, you know, their front yard or in their business. Um, the Whose proposal? I, I didn't get a packet tonight in my in my stuff, which I'm sorry I didn't realize until I got it all down here. But um, whose proposal is it to do the through right, right, right? That's the discussion that's been coming out of the Tacoma Langley sector plan process with the various community meetings and. and that okay, um, it seems to me that if I were a resident faced with, well, first I, I you know, University Avenue and. <laughs> And New Hampshire Avenue is a tough intersection and, and can stall me sometimes 45 minutes um, on what is ordinarily a 20 minute trip. The prospect of having people make all that, extra, spend all that extra time circulating. Um, and I, it, you know, I grew up in California, so I'm, not clo I'm used to the Cloverleaf intersection. I get that, but um, that's elevated. <laughs> this is going to be flat. And if I were coming from university and wanting to go to the district, I'd turn on Riggs Road and come over to East West Highway. And if I were coming down university and wanted to, um, you know, turn left or right, on, if I wanted to turn right at New Hampshire, I guess I could, but I'd probably go Piney Branch. Or I'd find some other way to go other than through that intersection. And people like to drive a straight line to their, to their location um, if they can. And um, we, we, we learned from the various traffic studies that psychologically people don't like to go backwards or sideways, although they do like to keep moving. Um, I, that's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing how that's going to work. Um, and, and then the other thing is I think at some point we're probably going to have to provide support to a decision. Well, the entire process of the Purple Line, at some point, leaders are going to have to stand up and they're going to have to say, you win and you don't. And this Purple Line is going to go in front of your house and it's going to go through your business. And I think that the, the approach that Doug suggests where we start by driving it through with principles first before we necessarily see, you know, all of 
all of the other components of that and the nitty gritty will, will make it easier for us as leaders then to say, look, here's the principles that we all laid out and that we agreed to. In the end, this is the route and the decision that makes the most sense and here's the maximum amount of mitigation we can provide to the people that are affected without really driving up the costs or essentially changing the structure of the, of the, um, of the solution. Um, so that's my commentary. Councilmember Samuels. I'd just like, uh, Susie, some feedback on the suggestion that we uh, focus the resolution on principles rather than the specifics that are in this document now. Thanks. Um, I think that having the principles listed is very important. Um, the Do you think it would be uh, uh, of benefit to the state planners to have those in lieu of the specifics that are in this resolution tonight? I do think that something more specific than general principles will be more useful. Uh, it doesn't need to be to the level that's in this document. The, um, the important portion, I think, is to give enough direction to the state planners so they can precisely estimate how much land that they will need to take how much, you know, construction that they need to do. And so um, what I would recommend is that um, at, as soon as possible, there be a fairly specific concept about what the correct amount of right-of-way should be for University and New Hampshire Avenue in Tacoma Park. I think that um, the... Um, the easier way for the state to do is to um, be as chintzy as possible. They obviously are looking at money. Um, and where that hurts is it hurts uh, for pedestrian safety and it hurts for having a comfortable commercial district. And so there's a certain point where I think it needs to be wider than that. Um, the, the downside is that if they budget a certain amount and, and plan for a certain configuration, and then because everybody has this outcry, well, this isn't sufficient pedestrian way, then they end up taking more from, from the Tacoma Park side of the, of the University Boulevard in particular. Um, one of the th principles that MTA has been using in coming up with its estimates is that they don't want to take any buildings. Uh, one of the things that's remarkable is that even in uh, the strongest of the kind of the most uh, destructive of these options, it only takes 12 buildings for the full length between Bethesda and New Carrollton, which really is quite remarkable through a built community. Is one of those um, the right aid? And the right aid is not to be affected, and they wouldn't affect it. The proposal then would be to take it more from the Tacoma Park side of University Boulevard, so it's not equally shared. You know, when they say expanding the right of way, they don't. It can go this way or it can go that sure, way. Sure, or both. So as to right, so as to best fit and to minimize the expense. Um, but what? We so we might have a, we see. might have a principle in a we revised might. resolution that would address those types of concerns. Exactly, and I think okay. we I think you know if if that's something that you would support, I think it would be really important. Okay. And I uh, just lastly wanted to compliment you on your selection of sweaters for this evening. Uh, you know what? I was so happy. My <laughs> husband had hidden this in our coat closet, and by, I'm sure by accident, and I found <laughs> it the other day and thought it was quite timely. <laughs> I was very glad to, to see it again. <laughs> yes, right? We're, we're trying to be coordinated here. And, and I noticed uh, the mayor was coordinated as well. Other comments? How would you like to... Well, let me, I have one comment, which is I was focused on the therefores. I always look at those as the meat of the re resolution. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do people generally feel about whereas is in resolutions? I look at those as kind of statement of background. Well, and, set the stage, certainly. And, and some of these in here are statement of just background. Right. So would people like to, we could, we, we need a resolution by uh, 
like next week. 12 days from now. That's correct. So uh, we could make some revisions to it and bring it back next week, but we need to do it next week. That's and we could see a draft of that uh, by midweek so we could have any comments back to you through email. Uh, so that we don't have uh, to just be reviewing it at the meeting on Monday. Right, I would try to get it out. Um, which we, don't which have, we did with this one, too. You know, we don't have work tomorrow, so there's a little bit of a delay, but I would try to get it out as quickly as possible. That's how Mr. Mack was prepared for the meeting tonight. Well, and, and you know, one of the things, um, I mean, I, they sent the draft out to the CDA and a number of other folks in advance so that they had an opportunity to, to really talk about it. Um, and uh, I anticipate doing that again. Okay, so uh, given that we have a resolution on the table, uh, would somebody like to move to table it till next week? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of tabling it until next Monday night, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. It's tabled till next week. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item is the consent agenda. There are three items on the consent agenda. A single reading ordinance awarding a contract. No, for, no, oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Wishful thinking there? Sure. Yes. Second reading ordinance authorizing budget number two. City manager, want to make any comments on the second reading? No, the only thing I would just note for the council um, since first reading um, is in discussions with the public works director, it does appear that we may be looking at a lower cost recycling truck than what was reflected in the first reading ordinance that you approved last week. Um, so if you'll note on the version that's included in the agenda packet, um, that amount has been changed from just over 249,000 to a more generic figure of approximately 210,000. Um, just so we're not appropriating more money from the equipment replacement reserve than is necessary. Um, the Public Works Director feels that that amount will be sufficient um, and there will be an ordinance actually purchasing that truck before the Council next week. And that was the only change since uh, first reading. Okay, and can you remind us what the total general contingency amount is, which is one half percent of revenues, but is that about? It's roughly about $97,000. Okay. So this would be using... Um, uh, 23,000. 23,000 of the 97,000. Correct. Okay. The only so, other thing I would just note very quickly is I think last uh, week there was a question about how general contingency account monies could be used um, in the cover sheet for the first reading ordinance. Um, I had referenced uh, unanticipated operating expenses that was actually the operating was my addition. It's not what actually is in the city charter. I did review this issue with the city attorney's office, and they're very comfortable with um, the use of the general contingency account monies for this purpose. Okay. Would somebody like to introduce the second reading? Introduce it. I'll introduce it. Second. So that was moved by Councilmember Siemens and seconded by Councilmember Robbins. Any further discussion? I just have a question back to the truck. Um, so would the truck be, would all recycling be commingled together or um, would it be separate? Um, I think that's actually, I mean, I guess the public works director could either address it this evening. That is an issue I think she would prepare to discuss with the council next week. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that to the council's discretion whether you'd like her to come forward now and make some comments or just discuss the matter next week. I guess the, the point I would just bring up is that, <clears throat> you know, we spend a lot of time gathering recycled materials and the equipment you buy might have an impact on how you operationalize or actually collect that material and that you may be able to do it more efficiently and so there may be a cost benefit to that where we would then save on staff dollars. Um, and knowing that budgets are tight, we need to be thinking about those sorts of uh, 
trade-offs. I'm not an expert in recycling. Um, I get a lot of comments from residents about different ways they could, it could be done. Um, you know, I think in the past, the county has used blue bins like our yellow bins for paper. Um, and the trade-off of that versus paper bags and what's more efficient and the waste of everyone having to have those paper bags also. So I, I just think we need to think through those things. And if the, I just don't want to be in a situation later on where I'm told, oh, well, we can't do that because we bought this truck. Um, so that, that's my only the, I mean, ultimately, I, that decision will be the council's when you approve um, or don't approve the ordinance that is before you next week purchasing the truck. I think the only decision this evening for the council, just as a reminder, is whether or not you wish to appropriate money. Um, clearly, depending on what type of truck you, per you elect to purchase, that may have some impact on whether the amount in this ordinance is correct or not, but that's not something that could not be amended at a later date either. I think it would be helpful if the Public Works Director could just tell us what, what the intent with this truck is given the amount of money that she's looking at so that we have a sense of that. It may be an issue. It may not be an issue. Yeah, not to um, spend too much time on it, lest you hear the whole presentation for next week. Uh, but it's actually because it's in a state of flux right now. Uh, we have in the past uh, relied heavily on Montgomery County for processing facility. Uh, basically, the county's processing facility in Gaithersburg is what we use for 90% of our material. We also use some private haulers. Uh, they are dedicated to a segregated split stream recycling where they have got a paper or a fiber stream and a commingled bottles and cans stream. That is not going to change in the foreseeable future for Montgomery County. Uh, they're invested in that. They're contract collection contracts, which go for seven years, and they're about to go out to bid again in February for another seven years. All are predicated on a segregated recycling collection stream. Um, jurisdictions around us are taking a slightly different take. Um, Prince George's County has gone to a single stream, what's called a single stream processing. Basically, everything is put into one container, your bottles and cans, your paper, all your recyclables <coughs> together in one. Um, and then the processing facility is built to manage that type of mixed together type of materials. Um, Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Prince George's County, they've all gone to a single stream processing facility. Montgomery County is sort of the lone holdout in terms of the segregated stream. And we can get into the details of that pro and con. I can talk for hours about that. But at any rate, uh, that's the reality of the situation. Oftentimes, jurisdictions go to single stream as a way to enhance participation, um, make it simple for uh, residents to participate, and increase the amount of materials that are ultimately collected. However, with that, you've got a high degree of waste. Basically, when you're mixing things together, you're going to contaminate some stuff that's going to end up in the waste stream. Uh, all things being equal, we're currently in negotiations with uh, jurisdictions outside of Montgomery County to see if they'll contract with the city for allowing us to use their single stream processing facility. We've gotten very favorable responses so far from both Prince George's County, Howard County, and Anne Arundel County. So we're currently in negotiations. All those facilities are run by waste management. Uh, Montgomery <laughs> County's facility is not. It's run by a separate or, um, uh, corporation. Um, that said, one of the biggest issues for us to determine is the cost of a truck for, for collecting with a segregated stream, basically your bottles and your paper separately, is much more expensive to the tune of forty to $60,000 more expensive than a truck where you can use basically a traditional trash truck, a rear load packer. Everything goes in, all together gets compacted, you can carry a lot of material, a lot of weight, and it's a significantly less expense. So we're, we've got everything out sort of on a balance sheet. We're looking at the pros and cons. Um, and, and we're still in a state of great discussion amongst our staff and amongst the department about which way to go. Uh, on the surface, it looks uh, much uh, less expensive for us to buy a traditional rear load truck and negotiate with a, a vendor to do the single stream processing. So if I had to guess at this point, that's the direction that I think we're likely to go given the uh, significant savings it would have in equipment. That being said, I don't see any staff savings at this point. We're a, prayer, a fairly lean organization in terms of the sanitation force, and so there isn't any 
potential savings and reduction of staff needed for those collection vehicles because they're all staffed to serve two and a half people per truck. And that can't change no matter what. So I don't, I don't see any, any reduction in our staff size in the sanitation division in order to um, take advantage of the single stream recycling. Is another variable the time it takes to get the trucks to whatever facility? Uh, yes, uh, the facility in Prince George's County is the most attractive to us. It's over on Ritchie Road. It would be about the same amount of time as we currently use spending uh, going up to Gaithersburg, slight different traffic patterns and issues like that to consider, but it's, it's about equidistance. Okay. So do, do we have any further discussion? I think that information was helpful. Is there any public comment on this ordinance? Okay. Um, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the second reading ordinance authorizing the budget amendment, please roll, say aye. Roll call. Oh. Roll call. Clerk, please call all. Aye. Council Member Barry. Aye. Council Member Clay. Aye. Council Member Robinson. Aye. Council Member Stevens. Aye. Council Member Sanders. Aye. Council Member Wright. Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. We now get to the consent agenda. Council Member Siemens. Siemens. There's too many S's. Council Member Siemens has requested that uh, consent agenda consent agenda item A be pulled for discussion, which we will do as soon as we pass the remaining items, unless anybody wants to pull B or C. And if you do, then we got no consent agenda. <laughs> Okay, so we have a consent agenda consisting of items B and C. Those are single reading ordinances, re rescinding ordinances, and authorizing uh, slight replacement ordinances. So uh, all those in favor of the consent agenda, please say, no, we have to do a, it's a single reading. We have to do a roll call of the consent agenda. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Wood. Aye. Councilman Barry. Aye. Councilman Clay. Aye. Councilman Robinson. Aye. 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 Okay, that passes. We now get to the uh, item A on the consent agenda, which is the single reading ordinance. We're going to contract for HVAC improvements to the third floor of the municipal building. Council Member Siemens. Thank you. Uh, you know, this community prides itself on our environmental uh, progressiveness and uh, Yet we continue to do things uh, with this building without uh, spending a whole lot of time of looking at how we can make this a greener facility. And I wonder if, um, if we are uh, taking a, a progressive step with the HVAC system we're ordering, if, uh, or if this is something, an opportunity that we could maybe do better uh, in making this a greener facility. Uh, if, and if we should be looking at this as just uh, one part of a, a bigger process of uh, moving this into a, uh, a facility that uses less energy. And I guess that's a, that's a question. Is, uh, uh, is this just more of the same in our energy use, or, or is this uh, a, uh, a step towards moving us into a more green facility? Public Works Director would like to uh, address that question. Yeah, I share your concern, uh, Council Member Siemens, about um, energy use, not only in this facility but in all the city facilities, and it's something I spent a great deal of time and energy, not too much, <laughs> uh, thinking about and working on and trying to dig up alternatives. Some of them are easy to grasp, and other of them are a little more difficult. Um, this building presents a challenge. Um, one of the situations that we have in front of us right now is we've got a significant section of the third floor that is not comfortable to staff in the summer. And I've heard that loud and clear and felt it myself. Uh, we currently have portable air conditioning units that are electric units that we plug in and uh, to, to cool that section of the building. That is a significant waste of energy as that's about the most expensive way uh, to get supplemental cooling. So one of the things I can tell you without a doubt is to remove those portable units and put in a functioning system that's going to be far more energy efficient in the long term than what we've currently got. However, what we um, 
what we've been advised by the folks that do this for a living, the mechanical engineers that have come in, evaluated our system, taken a look at sort of where we are with what we have, uh, is um, that we've got uh, some infrastructure within our building that's just not capable of meeting the cooling needs. Our chilling system in and of itself the, uh, the compressors, the swamp coolers, the fan units, they're able to do the job. The problem is our piping system between the units just is not of the age anymore that can uh, move the quantity of coolant material from the chillers and the compressors to the fan coil units to get the cold air out. Um, their recommendation, and, and uh, based on, on what I've seen, I, I, I strongly agree with it, is to... Uh, basically take our air handlers up on the floor, third floor out of their misery and replace them with rooftop heat pumps for the cooling capacity of the existing rear floor of the, um, the third floor. Uh, uh, heat pumps uh, are generally an efficient uh, model. These are all spec to meet Energy Star standards, so they're, they're compliant with Energy Star. They are efficient models. They do meet the, the uh, recommended uh, SEER and EER uh, standards, so we are purchasing equipment that is deemed efficient. Um, they'll basically provide the cooling that's needed in the back of that building. Um, in addition, what we found is that the uh, cable office, which uses a significant amount of equipment, a lot of cable equipment, a lot of computers, is hot all the time. And in fact, we've had problems because it's gotten so hot in there that it's fried some components. So it's a significant concern for us to keep that particular office, two rooms in particular, cool enough. Uh, and they're in a world of their own. They're not operating like the rest of the building. So they really need a separate system to sort of keep them cool and, and keep the equipment running. What's recommended there is a ductless air conditioning system that is specifically designed just for that space, sized just for that space, and is able to, to meet the needs of that space, not, and not any larger, not any smaller. So what you see before you is a proposal to add air conditioning in the areas that it's, that it's missing, remove our current portable systems, which are an energy drain. Uh, and then the next step, the next logical step, will be to take a look at our existing infrastructure in this building and say, okay, we had a chiller system that used to do the whole building. Now it's just down to maybe a half of what it used to, what it used to cool. Um, and what do we need to do with that? Uh, one of the things I have um, shared information-wise is uh, there was some wisdom back in 1996 when we put in that chiller system. It's a very efficient system, which is one of the reasons that we chose it. And it is uh, like no system I've ever seen, which most systems have a two-phase. You, know, you can go low or you can go high. This actually has four different uh, phases that it can jump to. So there's four fans, and you'll see them in the rear of the building when you come in. If you ever wonder what those four different fans are, those That's are the different the phases. Here, here periodically. Oh, this is the air handler that you hear here. It's, it's, it's a sound that you don't hear inside the building, but it basically works with the compressor and ramps up depending on the cooling needs of the building. Uh, so we have four fans as well as uh, three different swamp coolers. The swamp coolers are what reduce the humidity from the air. So we have a system that's really geared to step up uh, truly step up um, and go from a low need situation to a moderate to a more to a more to a higher situation. So I'm less concerned about um, the chiller system that we currently have being overloaded and oversized for this facility because it really was designed to be able to be stepped up and phased based on the need. So in a traditional situation, if you had a chiller that was put in to cool this whole building and now we've pulled different pieces off and we're now cooling them with different rooftop units, you would end up with a system that goes on for 15 minutes, off, on, off, on, and be an incredible waste of energy. We don't have that with our current system. We have a chiller that's really able to stay up at a, you know, at a moderate pace if it needs it, and then if we have those 90 or 100 degree days, it can ramp up again. Um, that's not to say that we won't be taking a look at that. There may be a point at which it no longer becomes effective to have the type of chilling system that we've had in the right, building just anymore. Two other real quick questions. One is you, you said that the recommendation is, uh, and you itemized some things for the third floor and the cable office, and those are the recommendations that are embodied in this uh, purchase? Yeah. And then secondly, uh, what I'm understanding you to say is that 
uh, we're not approving this to apply a Band-Aid that we would replace if we were to go to an energy efficient uh, redo of the HVAC, but yeah. this is something we would keep and we yeah. would just replace yeah. the other portions. Yeah. And in fact, the new systems of the building are largely cooled with rooftop units, so we'd be creating some consistency with the existing new structure. And it looks like Council Member Clay wonders about the heating. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Okay. Are there any other questions? Is there any public comment on this ordinance? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Aye. 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 Okay. That passes. We will move to our work session item, which is the uh, Safe Tacoma Progress Report. Get there in my packet. Um, would the city manager like to introduce this? Uh, in May of this year, the council authorized the execution of a memorandum of understanding with Safe Tacoma Incorporated. Um, one of the provisions of that memorandum of understanding was that no later than six months after the MOU was executed is that Safe Tacoma would provide the council with a formal progress report and at that juncture the council would provide direction to me uh, based on the progress report you're about to hear whether or not um, I should initiate the disbursement of the balance of the funds that the council allocated. Um, there are obviously representatives from Safe Tacoma here this evening, um, and I think I will just turn it over to, to Mr. Grimes, who's the president of Safe Tacoma. Okay, and if I can just uh, acknowledge uh, the lesson that uh, ANC Commissioner Green learned, which is uh, if you keep your papers off of those microphones, then you won't hear scratching in the room. <laughs> I learned that lesson, too. <laughs> Seth Grimes, I'm president of Safe Tacoma. We have with us Faith Wheeler, who is vice president, Sarah Green, who is secretary, Ronnie Miller, our operations manager, Andy Kellerman, lurking in the audience, who is our treasurer, Wolfgang Bergner is a member of our advisory committee, and also a, uh, an officer of the Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County, which is one of our program partners. Uh, we did have in the audience earlier this evening several uh, representatives of the Tacoma Park Community Action Group. Uh, so uh, I want to thank Diane, Susan, and Norman who were here. Uh, Joyce Siemens who is still here. Uh, uh, I don't think she will have anything to say, but uh, she's here. Uh, Diane Barkley in particular participated in the Help Increase the Peace Program training that we ran about a year ago. Uh, so I, I will uh, thank uh, City Manager Matthews for the introduction. So uh, we're supposed to present a progress report toward our work plan, which was presented to you in May. I, I do want to start off with a quick personal note, uh, which I wouldn't normally do. Uh, I had my bicycle stolen from the Tacoma Metro Station on Thursday. Someone cut my lock. Uh, next time I'll get a better lock, better cable and all that. And I also want to note that my 14-year-old uh, son, Raphael, knows one of the kids who was shot uh, recently on Rydon. Raphael, for the last three years of middle school, rode Rydon past the Flower and Arliss intersection uh, twice a day to get to school. He still rides Rydon to get home. Uh, this, he wasn't victimized himself, but my point being, uh, everyone in the community uh, can potentially fall victim to crime of one sort or another. Uh, and that's a motivator for being here. Uh, so our, our progress report does have uh, five sections really to correspond to five sections in the work plan. Uh, one of the sections is organizational. And uh, we did put as much as we thought was appropriate in written form for you to refer to. Um, and I'm not going to read this or anything like that. Just on the organizational front to touch on high points. Uh, after receiving the council's authorization for the work plan uh, and the budget uh, through Chief Percucci, we went ahead and engaged an operations manager, Ronnie Miller, whom we met in September at the uh, session then. And we've done other steps according to the work plan to get an office, other organizational things to just get going as, a, as an organization. Uh, next up is uh, fundraising, which I skipped, uh, section B here. Our work plan called for us to start work on fundraising for other grant sources uh, than the cities. 
uh, around this time, and we're doing that. Uh, we expect to apply for a Maryland state grant in the coming weeks, uh, and I would guess that Chief Rucucci is going to uh, be applying for one for the CSAFE program as well from the same source. And we've identified other sources, and we'll get to work on that. Uh, the meat of what we have to report on, of course, is programming and the meat of your interest. And we have four program areas for the work plan. Uh, they were youth programming, uh, which constitutes conflict resolution, youth development, youth offenders, and then also community engagement. Uh, before turning it over to some of my colleagues, I'll mention on the youth offenders, there's a short section on that. That was programming that would target uh, youth offenders to try to uh, help them stay out of trouble once they've been into the juvenile justice system. That is not something that we had contemplated starting before now. We contemplated starting it toward the end of this year, the beginning of next year, so we don't have anything to say about that. For conflict resolution, I'll turn it over to Faith Wheeler. Thank you, council members. The conflict resolution program is really the first operational uh, program that we en engaged in. And we've uh, started it off over a year ago with sponsoring three participants in a um, initial program that was already undergo undergoing in Washington and had um, a good result in as much as uh, we had a stellar uh, participant who became in the next uh, workshop that we that we ourselves sponsored in November. He was in fact an assistant facilitator, so that was quite a good outcome. Um, so in November and then again in February and March, we've held two workshops of ten participants each. In November, it was held at the Tacoma D.C. Community Center. And in February and March, it was held with Tacoma Park, Maryland Community Center. And um, <clears throat> this summer, this past summer, we held, uh, we went into a different format, really, and wanted to expand our reach and, and uh, engage more people, more, more young people, really. And so we held um, seven and eight week sessions in the Tacoma, D.C. Community Center and also in the Tacoma Park, Maryland Community Center with um, programs with sports campers and also with counselors. Those were um, experiments. They were brand new, helped, helped in peace decrease, helped increase the peace program, had not engaged in that kind of format before. Uh, the conflict resolution program is very experiential. And that seems to be a new notion to a number of people. I think people tend to expect something rather didactic as though sitting in a classroom and having somebody lecture at you. This is completely different. It's totally experiential. And that, that notion, that um, format was, it took quite a while for uh, the managers of the, of the particular community centers to understand. But um, it was a, they were all nonetheless uh, supportive and helpful uh, and eventually understood <laughs> just what it was about. And uh, the participants, in fact, I think benefited of, in spite of the fact that it was off to a little bit of a shaky start. I uh, happened to run into one participant on the bus and um, struck up a conversation and she was in a three-week nursing program and uh, she said, well, you know, a lot of people need this conflict resolution program and uh, it helped me a lot in my nursing, my nursing course. So I had to stop and think about how to deal with people instead of my usual way. And so I thought, well, that's a sample of one and hopefully it's replicated by other participants as well. <clears throat> we do, we are looking forward to uh, Continuing with conflict resolution, with the basic course, which is roughly two and a half days, perhaps in some different formats, splitting it in two, two sections. And then um, our idea, basically, is to be able to have a multiplier effect so that we will uh, produce trainers, uh, or facilitators, I should say, in a training of facilitators workshop, which is the second part of the conflict resolution.
resolution program. Um, and we hope to be doing that within the first half of next year. I have enough of a base of people who have gone through the basic training to and interested in moving forward. In the, we'll be interested to know that in the February-March workshop held here in, in this building, uh, eight of the ten participants that said that they really would like to go on and take the training facilitators program. So that will help us expand our reach as we develop facilitators to um, conduct more of the conflict resolution programs. Let me, let me add about the summer programs. You'll see in this uh, progress report toward the top of page four. We had our trainers, Monica Magiesi and Jacob Stone, both of whom uh, were affiliated at some points with Conflict Resolution Center of Montgomery County. Jacob was working there over the summer, and Monica had uh, formally. We had them write a, a, a report that included lessons learned from the experiences in the summer camp programs. It's a very frank report. We didn't include it in the agenda packet, but it is available on our website for you to read. Uh, they give some stats here about the goals that were accomplished. I'll emphasize that it was a frank report. You might find it interesting reading. Uh, next, let's, I'll, I'll assume that you'll have questions about everything after we're done, okay. Uh, next, uh, Ronnie, uh, why don't you talk about youth development? Okay, um, good evening. The youth programming plans that was outlined in the work plan was basically based on partnerships with the Tacoma Park Community Action Group and the Tacoma, Tacoma Park Recreation Department um, and the Community Center in D.C. Um, but based on the statistics that almost all of the street and property crime that occur in our focus area are committed by youth, we felt that it would make sense for us to focus our efforts on youth issues. So therefore, in partnership with the Maryland and D.C. Community and Recreation Centers, um, we've developed a Rites of Passage program that targets youth age 13 through 17. We're currently in the development stages of creating the pre-apprenticeship uh, program um, in partnership with the Tacoma Park Community Action Group. Uh, through the, with the Rites of Passage program, um, what it is is uh, a program that will empower the youth in the focus area uh, with the knowledge and skills uh, and abilities to successfully transition from adolescence through adulthood. Uh, they would be involved in experiential uh, exercises, discussions, and workshops, and it's designed to facilitate, build, and strengthen the life skills um, that are crucial uh, to their development, such as social, emotional, uh, personal, physical, and civic. The program, uh, which is going to be offered for boys and girls in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and for girls currently in Tacoma, D.C., is scheduled to begin on November 19th and the 20th, respectively. Um, it will run for eight weeks, meeting for an hour each week, and it will commence on the ninth week uh, with a ceremony signifying their successful passage. Uh, the pre-apprenticeship program will target youth age 18 through 25, and it will be offered to young men and women in the Tacoma Park, Maryland, and Tacoma, D.C. areas and we're targeting that we'll probably, you know, hopefully get that started around late winter, early spring of next year. Um, and both of these programs aim to provide the youth in our focus area with opportunities and outlets uh, that will lessen the likelihood of their uh, being drawn into criminal lifestyles or committing crimes uh, based on necessity. I, I will add just a few points again. Um, here's an article from the July 30 Gazette on a county uh, program. Uh, Tom Perez is quoted in here uh, on for pre-apprenticeship. Quotes one fellow, this changed my whole perspective, said Timothy Good, 18 of Baltimore City in this case, uh, a graduate of the program who was accepted into an apprenticeship. Uh, these people are saying now I can uh, get a job and also a career, but learn, uh, I get paid while I learn. 
Uh, it's about giving independence, job skills to go in the workforce. So our interest really is in teaching job skills and really life skills to uh, these people. And we would proceed the pre-apprenticeship with a series of programs like the Rites of Passage but suited to older kids. That is the expensive, I will acknowledge, element in our work plan for outside expenditures. Uh, so, you know, we acknowledge that. I also wanted to add there that, as I think you all know, we've been working with former council member Larry Rubin, who is an employee of the Carpenters Union on this, on developing the programming. He has uh, some expertise in that, and we appreciate his help. And council member Siemens has been involved in that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, the next was community engagement. We discussed at the September 22nd council meeting the National Night Out Whistle Program. We gave you some stats then that are repeated in this progress report. We don't need to read them again, but we did a couple of things <laughs> since then. One is we invited people who took whistles and gave us email addresses to complete a survey, and there are a few stats from uh, that survey in here. A few notable stats were that 70% uh, said the whistle makes them feel either a little safer or uh, uh, one said much safer. And 55% said that the area around the Tacoma Metro Station is safe only during the day. Uh, that's interesting. 15% said safe only during rush hours. 20% said not safe. People also gave us an idea about uh, uh, what they thought were the biggest vulnerabilities around the Metro Station. Ronnie, do you want to say something about the second whistle distribution that we had? We had our second whistle distribution last Thursday, uh, November 6th, in which we um, gave out about 100, over 150, almost 160 whistles. Um, we received the registration sign-ups back uh, from those individuals. And, um, and basically 21 individuals are interested in joining Citizens Patrol. Uh, 23 would like to arrange a police home safety inspection, and of course we'll forward their information um, to the appropriate police departments. 76 would like to join the Alert Tacoma email list. Um, 26 also stated that they would consider volunteering with Safe Tacoma, and 53 are interested in conflict resolution programming. Okay. Uh, one of our metrics for our community engagement program was the number of people we did get to sign up for various things, including home inspections by the police, uh, joining various patrols and other activities and so on. Uh, we also had, for that matter, people who would attend community crime forums and so on. Uh, we have a realization here that and this applies not only to public safety matters, that it's often very difficult to get people to come out to meetings. They'll come out to meetings on crime issues when something pretty bad has happened, or if uh, something new has happened, like we get a new chief, uh, which I hope we won't have that occasion for quite a long time. So uh, we're, we're taking a, a, more, uh, a more targeted approach to uh, maybe give something to people, but in exchange for information and for commitments to get involved in community issues. We don't need to ask them to come to meetings that they're not going to come to, for the most part. We want to ask them to get involved in ways that they're very comfortable getting involved in. So uh, the whistle program gets safety whistles <coughs> into people's hands, and we hope they'll never use them, but you know, maybe they will come in useful. But it also is part of our community building effort around public safety. Uh, another element of our community engagement is what we call neighborhood safety perspectives. We gave that to you in, our, in the council packets on September 22nd. Uh, we've done a couple of things there. We've done some of the physical assessments of conditions and so on. And we heard what you said. Uh, for instance, council member Clay noted that she wouldn't want to be sending letters to people who don't have their porch lights on. Well, that was a very good point. Uh, so we collected statistics on numbers of houses. And what we would hope to do is change people's uh, approaches to like leaving their porch lights on by uh, essentially targeting everyone. So uh, we've had discussions with the police department about distributing safety flyers on a periodic basis. We have one from the police department on home safety that will be distributed in the Philadelphia Eastern neighborhood in the coming weeks with our newsletter. And in other old Tacoma neighborhoods, we're trying to uh, make contacts with people in those neighborhoods to distribute those things door to door. So we'll try to change attitudes excuse me, uh, based on uh, what we learned in some of these safety assessments uh, in maybe uh, not completely a direct way. On the other hand, when we notice stuff like street lights that are out, we can try to take care of that kind of thing directly. Uh, so um, we've done 
the assessments in Tacoma Park, we expect uh, that is the physical assessments. Uh, I haven't yet given those results to uh, the chief or the public works director because uh, we sort of haven't figured out what to do about some of that. Some of the things uh, that we reported are things that we wouldn't do anything about, like leaning street signs. That seems to be the norm rather than the exception. Anyway, uh, we recorded them all the same. And we did uh, uh, conduct an attitude survey. And part of this was not only to find out do you feel safe, but what specifically makes you feel unsafe and do you think can be improved. Uh, we're sharing access to the survey responses with the chief who has graciously said that uh, uh, that Kyleen will, uh, the crime analyst, can uh, spend some time helping us with the analysis. And as of uh, this afternoon, I think, I don't have it in front of me, we had something like 118 responses, and I hope they'll prove useful. So um, I think that's it about the neighborhood safety assessments and community engagement. Uh, we're doing our best to try to reach out to people, uh, get names, get people involved with specific things they can do other than just coming to meetings, and try to get uh, to work with the police to get information out. And I think that wraps up uh, all that we have to say by way of a progress report. Uh, otherwise, we gave you a copy of our October monthly report, which we uh, provide to the police representatives on both sides. It includes the funding balances and so on. As of October 31st, uh, there was still nearly $14,000 left from the Tacoma Park allocation. Uh, we, Ronnie had been working for half time for the first three months. Uh, as of October, we moved her to three quarters time, so that's going to be chewing up more money. Uh, we do um, have our budget out through the end of our fiscal year, which is September 30th, and we have, uh, assuming that you grant us the rest of the funds that have been budgeted, uh, we uh, should be well covered there. And as we mentioned at the beginning, we'd make the transition to uh, fundraising through grants uh, and other sources than in the city of Tacoma Park. Um, so thanks, and we'd be very pleased to take questions or comments or whatever. If I can first just comment that uh, you notice that all the street signs are leaning. You should have noticed that they're all leaning in one direction, left, so that they match the community. <laughs> That's where you stand. <laughs> well, point of view, yeah. Um, and I was happy to see the, uh, the report that you uh, gave us today. Uh, it answered some of the questions that I had about uh, community engagement. But I guess what I would just ask is uh, if, if you're happy with uh, the extent that you've engaged the community in the different ways that you've engaged the community, or if there are other things that you see uh, that you would like to do or any other approaches. It sounds like you've, you've recognized some of the, the difficulties, but I'm just wondering if there's any other ways that you're thinking that you might like to head. Hmm? We're always learning, I think, and that's, uh, that's part of this experiment, which is, is quite new. And um, we sort of adjust as we go along. And <clears throat> I think, yes, for sure. What I've noticed is that, just in my conversations with folks on this side, on the DC side of, the, of Old Tacoma, is that uh, more and more folks know about Safe Tacoma uh, through hearing about the different <clears throat> the programs that we've been engaged in. And um, that's, that's certainly positive. And we do have plans to expand and, and continue and uh, look into different what different possibilities. One possibility I might mention in addition is um, uh, possibly in, in Coolidge, I, again I have to speak in terms of Tacoma DC because that's what I'm familiar with, Tacoma Park, I'm sure there are other possibilities. But uh, Coolidge High School uh, may be interested in some uh, aspect of conflict resolution uh, there, incorporated in a, a new um, management system, which hopefully will be taking place next year with the Bedford Academy from New York. <clears throat> We're looking into the possibility of rites of passage program with Tacoma Elementary School uh, with our brand new principal, who is wonderful and, and is outreaching, reaching out to the community, which is a very new experience for us uh, compared to the past several years. And so there, there are opportunities, just opportunities that come up in uh, various ways, various times. Thanks. My colleagues have questions. Come. 
have some comments. Um, I continue to have a fundamental objection to the to the structure of Safe Tacoma within the city of Tacoma Park. Um, yeah, I had this objection when it first came up, and we was told a bunch of things, including, you know, this is really going to be focused on crime prevention, and this wasn't going to be a project that went off in lots of different directions, and it was all going to be about this community organizing in response to crime prevention, but it seems to be moving in, in other directions other than what was even talked about it the first time when I initially objected to it and felt like it was a lot of money and <clears throat> had some equity issues with it. But, you know, the base of this is that as an elected official, it's, it's my job to spend money on behalf of the citizens of Tacoma Park, and this continues to feel to me like a project that we've given money out without a grant competition, without uh, a notice of funds that was available to, you know, different people in the city of Tacoma Park, and that it was a, it was a giveaway at a time when emotions were running really high about a spate of on-street muggings in, in Ward 1. Um, and I think it got expanded a little bit into Ward 3 and a little bit into Ward 4 to get some more political buy-in. But um, I still feel like fundamentally the way I'm seeing the materials come forward to the council is kind of antithetical to how I see the role of city government and the role of policymakers and my role as somebody to safeguard the taxpayer dollars. And the other thing about that is this, the city is so small. So, like, you know, I find a lot of the things that you're engaged in interesting, and they're good projects. You know, giving the whistles out to the people at the Metro is a good project. Uh, different things about the youth engagement is a good project. The community organizing and getting people to come out to meetings and getting people to sign up for um, the citizen patrols, that's a good project. So it begs the question to me, if this is a good project that we're going to put forth as a priority for the city of Tacoma Park to engage in, you know, why aren't we doing it in the entire city? And um, so that's part of it. Um, I am concerned to hear that you're going to compete for the same funds that our CSAFE program is competing for. Because another one of the things that was said at the initial meetings is that this would not have any kind of a negative impact on CSAFE, and there wasn't going to be any competition with CSAFE. And I don't know if anybody else remembers that, but I remember that being a very clear, distinctive line um, when, when that went forward. Um, so we talked initially that this was going to be a crime initiative. It seems like a youth program. Um, and, you know, I like the youth program, so I'm, of course, intrigued by the various youth program elements, and they sound interesting and engaging, which is great. Um, but I, I still have to match that, you know, whether or not I like it, and I think it's great. There are a lot of things that I like and think are great, but that I, you know, I couldn't, um, I couldn't promote the city spending tax dollars on, especially when it wasn't something that was being offered to all folks. The, um, I see a thousand dollars for a employment training program with the Carpenters Union that was going to be targeted to kids in the Safe Tacoma Initiative area. Did I see that correctly? Is that a correct interpretation that's a, about $1,000 per, per was, kid uh, and this is targeted to kids in the Safe Tacoma Initiative area? The, the cost to the Carpenters Union was 9000 per 10 or 16000 per 20. Okay. We would do half and half DC and Maryland. The, the point you raise about who participates is a very good one, uh, and it's one that we've dodged, basically. We're not turning people away if they're living outside of our area, because uh, our criteria are that they have something to do with the Bolt Tacoma, our focus area. They use the transit facilities, they work there, they live there, uh, and you know, basically everyone in Tacoma Park, if you take everyone's great salt, uses the farmer's market, the metro station, and so on. And we'll give you a list of, for instance, of addresses of people who took our whistles, and you'll find plenty of people in your ward. You know, it's actually it's not about my ward, because I have to tell you that if members of my ward came to me and said, hey, Colleen, we want $75,000, and later we're going to tell you what we're going to spend it on, and then later they came to me and they said these were the things that they were going to spend it on, I'd have to say no. I'd have to say I can't support that. Um, and I think that... Um, 
So let me make a couple comments, and I'll tell you why I would say no, and then I'll just be done with my comments. Um, there was a comment in there about how the city could provide support. It would require little staff. It would just require staff time. Um, I'm pressed now to get staff time from the staff. And, and staff time is incredibly valuable, and it is actually a cost to us. It's an opportunity cost. When we give staff time out to do one thing, it means they're not doing some other thing that is a city priority. And again, I think that this, it's the council, mem the council member's job to define those city priorities, and we did so in the beginning of the year when we set out the budget, and we already overworked the staff. Um, and I'm sure I'm long overdue for a chocolate fountain party. Um, I'm also curious about the plans to expand because I continue to be concerned that the council is going to be that eventually what's going to happen is you're going to come and you're going to say look we've had this person on for half time or three quarters time or eventually full time and, and now we have this momentum and we really want you to continue to fund it. So let me tell you the reason why I would say no if my if, if were two constituents came to me and asked to do the same project that you're running. Um, I would say no because I think that the, the area of most need for this kind of activity is not Ward 2. Um, I would have to venture that it's Wards 4, 5, and 6. I think we've said that as a council, that those are our council priorities. The, you know, the recent tragic, unfortunate incident that happened, did it happen last weekend on the bus? It was the weekend before. You know, was a, I think the, the young man was a Ward 4 resident and the other 20 year old was a board five resident um, so I mean not only do I not just want to see that everybody in the city is included but if I was going to target especially an expense like a thousand dollars I mean I think that the, the carpenters program is a great idea but I, I think we're off our we're spending money here off of our target areas and off of the priorities and things that we put forth as a, as a council. And, and those have been my issues with this during the whole process, and they, they continue to be my issues with it. And it's not, you know, to disregard any of the good activities that you're doing or say that I don't value more, that I'm not even interested in them. I am. But just, you know, in terms of my responsibility is how I have to play out my role as a council member. I can't support it like this. Other comments? Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I thank you all for coming here tonight and staying to this late hour. Um, I really appreciate the report that you've uh, gone over here and given us tonight. Uh, it's um, It really makes me feel good to see the progress that has been made since the last time you were here. Uh, you've got much more organization to your work. You uh, have uh, many accomplishments where in the past you were talking about what was coming. Uh, you've actually completed some of these projects or at least in, in progress in some of them. And um, it shows the, uh, the great benefit to having uh, Ronnie uh, as the executive director and, and moving these things forward. I, um, I know that, uh, as you mentioned, that you're partnering with the Tacoma Park Community Action Group on several of these things, and I, and I think one of the areas uh, that you overlooked in answering the mayor on community engagement is the work that uh, you've been doing with the, the Tacoma Park Community Action Group. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this session, I don't know if you all were here at the time, uh, but the Tacoma Park Community Action Group, uh, in partnership with some 30 other organizations, including Safe Tacoma, is um, organizing a youth forum of, um, of young people from uh, the local schools here in Maryland, and that includes uh, Blair High School and, and Tacoma Park Middle School and some of the other schools here in, in the area. Uh, and that has uh, included the principals from those schools. And so I know that, uh, that the community engagement that you're doing here in Maryland, which is uh, my special interest, um, is, uh, is really ramping up. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, your participation in that I think is uh, is much appreciated. The um, 
you know, I hear Council Member Clay's concerns, but uh, I look at uh, Safe Tacoma and the work that you're doing. Um, I was, you know, hesitant uh, in the beginning uh, with what the, your original request was. Uh, maybe I got caught up in the emotions at the time, uh, but I think, um, you know, having made that commitment, I felt like we needed to follow through on that commitment uh, and give you uh, guidance on what we expected out of it. And I and I see from your report that you're responding to that guidance and uh, addressing the uh, the interests of this council. The thing I like about Safe Tacoma is uh, I see it as kind of a model project for a different way of doing business and addressing the uh, crime concerns. It's uh, certainly a different approach than what our police department is expected or are able to do, and it's a different approach than what is being used in the C-Safe uh, program in the Tacoma Langley Crossroads area. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the results of this uh, of this model uh, because, as Chief Rikuchi has told us, you know the police uh, cannot do everything on their own. You know it takes the community involvement really to uh, help decrease crime. And I see the types of programs that uh, that you've talked about here with the pre-apprenticeship program and the conflict conflict re resolution. Um, and some of the other things as being a different approach than we have used here in Tacoma Park in the past to addressing the, the crime and seeing if we can lower crime. Uh, I, um, I look forward to seeing the results. As you mentioned, you know, I was uh, uh, involved some with the pre-apprenticeship program. I went out and talked with the Carpenters Union about what they have to offer. I um, uh, I think it's a again a very uh, positive approach to uh, taking some young men and women who are in a um, a position of not having the skills and, and yet entering uh, adulthood, uh, giving them a, a very positive alternative. Uh, yeah, it's different. It's a little bit more costly than uh, not doing it but it might be a whole lot less costly than letting them enter into uh, some of the alternatives that some of our young people are choosing, and that is a, you know, a life of crime. I think the, the $1,000 is, uh, is a whole lot less than probably it costs us the first time they get arrested. So uh, I'm interested to see you know, how this progresses. Uh, I don't, I'm not interested to see you come back and say, okay, we want uh, a big chunk of money again next year. Uh, I'm really interested in seeing you follow through on your, your fundraising because it's something that's going to need uh, to do some fundraising to get the uh, uh, keep the program going. And I think uh, Council Members Clay's concerns about uh, uh, not competing with CSAFE is, is a legitimate concern. And I would expect that you would coordinate with Chief Picucci. Uh, so that he feels comfortable that he doesn't have two projects that are, uh, you know, running against each other, but projects that are, are uh, at least in the fundraising aspect, uh, working cooperatively. Thank you. Councilmember Robinson. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, I don't have much to add, um, but I, I'm not averse to using city funds to have good works and uh, social services provided in, out in the field. Not averse to that at all. And um, and I'm also I'm reminded um, I'm thinking about um, how we spend our money in other departments in the city. Um, sometimes uh, wishing that those that the services would be m more out in the field. And so you you're doing that. You're putting the services out in the field. And um, I'm a little unclear on what the numbers mean that you bring back to us or what the analysis means. Um, this big the beginning. And I don't know how many how what um, what our expectations are when it comes to spending money that we have um, in this way for um, reducing 
potential of crime or reaching out to kids. I'm, I'm a little bit at sea on what we ought to expect. But I like the approach, and um, I hope that you are building a model so that um, other areas can be served if, it, if it's appropriate. Um, I can't help comparing what you're doing with what's going on in REC and I'm wondering, well, how much bang for the buck are we getting um, in, in the money, the dollars spent in this endeavor as opposed to the dollars spent uh, for recreation. I mean, they're different beasts, but uh, at the same time, um, we're reaching out directly to kids and with a hope of having a direct impact and reducing um, behavior that we don't want to see in the future and in REC. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I'm, I'm intrigued. I don't have answers. Uh, I'm looking for more, but I'm intrigued by what you're doing. Thank you. Can I interject? Uh, the, uh, the Rites of Passage program that will start you know, next week in Tacoma Park, Maryland, is cooperative with the rec department here. Ronnie would teach the girls' sessions, or lead the girls' sessions, and uh, Oheen Gaston, who is a uh, rec department employee, would do the boys' sections. Uh, do you want to say a little bit more about how that would work, just briefly? Um, basically, it's the same curriculum, just tailored to the male female aspect of it. I'll facilitate the girls. Um, he will facilitate the males. And um, at certain times, we'll come together to do different activities. Um, I've been working with him as well as Alexandria um, Wilson um, to develop this whole program. Uh, she felt that there was a definite need um, here for that sort of program, so that's when we decided to come together and do it, you know, as a team. Other comments or questions? Can Could I just, oh. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to interject something. I, I think that we all have agreed we're not police and that we're not going to duplicate what the police do but that living in communities, as you do, as I do, that you see a deficit someplace. And one of the deficits um, that I have certainly seen uh, is the way kids and adults, black, white, what, whatever, interact. I've seen, we see deficits in the way kids resolve problems with each other. And having attended one of the conflict resolution workshops, I, I think that there is an enormous opportunity there to, to really find a way of making us better neighbors and dealing with some crime issues, not all of them obviously, um, but dealing with a lot of issues in a proactive way that will make this community a better place to live. And I think it is a very difficult thing to pull off. But I think this is, this is an approach that we have made a commitment uh, to develop. And I think that at some point, fairly soon, I think it's something that is going to be of value to this community that can be duplicated elsewhere. And we'll be able to say to people, don't do it that way. We already do it that way. And there are different approaches with conflict resolution. I've never seen anything quite like this, and I think this has an enormous amount of potential. Thanks. First, I want to say thank you to all of you uh, for volunteering your time. I think you've put in an incredible amount of effort into this uh, for a number of years now. I continue to remain supportive of, um, of the project. Um, I'm glad that we were actually able to get the money to you and start, um, and I look forward to getting the rest of the money to you. Um, I, do, I do think that um, you know, some of the issues that Colleen raised are, are, are very justified, and I, I think um, the way I think about this is sort of that for each individual communities or community within Tacoma Park or area, um, there's going to be problems or issues that come up, and we should really figure out a way to fund and engage the, the community to help solve those issues. So that may be different in um, around the metro, which you know includes Ward 1 and Ward 3, and, and I think rightfully is stretched a little bit into Ward 4, um, versus up at the crossroads or um, um, 
you know, where the shooting happened. I think the issues may be different, uh, but engaging the community and helping to solve the problems is critical. So, and that's what you guys have really started to do. Um, I would give a couple bits of advice around focus. So I think, um, you know, all the research about crime, long-term crime prevention does talk about addressing opportunity and in instructing, uh, giving youth more opportunity and providing programming for youth, programming for youth and conflict resolution, all those sorts of things. I do worry about the amount of resources we have and um, here to, to deal with those issues and how large the area is in terms of where people are coming from that commit crimes here. So um, if you look at the statistics, uh, and the chief is here, he may, you know, has a lot more information about this than I do, but most of the crime is not committed by individuals from within Tacoma Park, um, and mo most of it's probably not committed by individuals just over the border in D.C. Many of the, you know, many of the people who commit the crimes are from D.C., but they're further into D.C. or they're over in P.G. County um, uh, or Prince George's County. Sorry. So I just I worry a little bit about the ability to, through conflict resolution or uh, the youth engagement piece, to be able to really, with the resources we have, create enough of an impact on the catchment area of where the individuals are coming from committing the crime. So that's a little bit of a concern of mine. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things. It will help with um, crimes by individuals that are from Tacoma Park or from the uh, Tacoma, D.C., um, but that's not the majority of where the crimes are being committed from. And I would like to see more of a, a focus on the community engagement. So I went back and looked at the work plan, and, um, you know, there's talk, talk in there about realizing that to get more patrol participation or to get people to do safety analyses on their house and stop leaving their screen doors open or, or uh, do even more drastic things, that it's really going to take more one-on-one -on -one interactions. Um, and that, to me, goes back to sort of community organizing where probably we should have some of the either volunteer or staff time spent doing door knocking, having substantive one-on-one -on -one conversations with people about what's going to get them engaged. Maybe it can start with kind of following up in an aggressive way around the lists um, generated by the whistle program, substantive training around the, the whistles because, um, you know, giving the whistle out is only, and I've said this to you all before, is sort of half the battle. The second half is making sure that everyone knows what to do when the whistle gets blown, and, and, and that takes, subs, you know, substantive training. So I'd like to see... Um, and I also think back to that diagram you have in the work plan where community engagement is sort of the building block for everything. Um, and then on top of it comes other things. And so I really think we need to spend more effort, resources, and time on the hard work of community engagement. And then I would even put the last item, I forget the terminology used, but the, the recidivism, you know, prevent youth offenders. youth offenders. Like, I would say that should go on the back burner until we really get community engagement um, done incredibly well in an intense way and the other programs we already are working on uh, in an intense way. And then my last piece of advice is just around fundraising. You know, you can't, you can't start soon enough. Um, there's just a long cycle associated with applying for grants and then getting them. And um, I mean, I, th I think it's good that you're starting. I am also concerned about the conflict with CSAFE. Um, but I think if I remember, the number on the grant is pretty small. It's like $3,000 or something like that. Yeah, there are actually 50 grants of up to 3000 3, so Right. we'd be one of 50 applicants, and presumably CSAFE right. would also. But my point more is we're going to need to go after some ten, fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars substantive grants to to replace the the seed money, which is what I view the the city money um, as, because um, I like Colleen and and Terry would not be supportive of giving another substantive amount of money from the or large amount of money from the city, um, but I see this as a seed uh, a seed grant. Um, so those are my comments. Uh, done more by way of uh, community engagement than we could report progress on. You know, we've had conversations with Pastor Mark Reiner at the Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church. 
with individuals at the Seekers Church. Uh, Ronnie is going to be meeting, you said, with someone from Trinity Episcopal on Piney Branch Road in the district. That, that hasn't come to yeah, th these haven't come to fruition yet, but we're, we're trying to leverage the community institutions to get out to individuals and so on. We just don't have anything that we can report by way of progress. And, oh, right, um, about where criminals are coming from. Let's, th those are good points. There are two sides of the equation, however. The other side is victims. What we're trying to also do is reduce the possibility of victimization. That's what trying to get people to put their porch lights on about uh, carrier safety whistles. That's what that's all about. You know, my friend Lauren Taylor does these courses on self-defense so targeted to uh, women, young women, and so on. It'd be great to, and that's about uh, staying out of trouble uh, or, or diffusing situations. It's, it's great to be able to do that to reduce victimization, and that's something where uh, there's no question about where the people involved are. Yeah, that, that's why I think we need more. I think more of that's going to be as a result of the kind of community engagement piece. And I would love to see, you know, one of the things probably a failing in the MOU and the work plan is we didn't talk about, there's metrics in there, but we didn't say, what is, you know, what does success look like? So we have a metric, but, you know, does, does a metric mean, uh, you know, is it 50? new people participating in tr patrols? Is it 100? Is it 1,000? You know, so there, there's no, like, number in there. And I think one good thing for you all to do would be to really think about what success looks like and then be shooting towards that. Because I think it's great to have more conversations with members in churches and, and have ongoing conversations. But really, the rubber hits the road when you get people to be engaged in a more substantive way, whether it's in a patrol or in a safety training or that sort of stuff. Councilmember Barry. Barry. Yes, uh, thanks for coming, and I uh, continue to support very strongly uh, the program. Um, I think Terry touched on this, uh, but it's absolutely true, uh, and that is $70,000, while not an insignificant sum of money, uh, pales beside the cost of a single offender who gets into the system where uh, over the course of a lifetime it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars of public expenditure, if not millions. And that doesn't even include the costs uh, to, to the victims uh, and other members of society. So uh, the 70 grand is always a good investment, and it sounds like uh, you, you are spending the money in a prudent fashion. Uh, but as um, the other colleagues have uh, indicated, and, and it seems it comes down to a dual focus, one is uh, the population, the pre-offender population that you're reaching out to. Uh, and, of course, here uh, the, the, um, the challenge is to uh, target individuals uh, carefully, as carefully as possible, and one learns how to do that over time. Uh, it's not something that uh, you, will, you will know how to do immediately, but hopefully that's part of the learning that you're going through. Uh, the second uh, major thrust, it seems to me, is the target hardening, and this includes the porch lights, but more than that, it it uh, includes reaching out to every household within this area, wide area uh, of your work, uh, and making sure that they get the information about how to keep themselves safe, how to cooperate with their neighbors, how to communicate with the police. Uh, very important. And you have built-in metrics there because you have households and you have businesses in your surface area, and you can make it a point uh, to touch all of them uh, multiple times. In looking for... Uh, the offender population, you know, maybe one needs to look uh, a little more broadly. And it seems to me that, you know, one area to look at is the uh, number of citations that the Metro Police uh, are giving. This is the transit system police are giving uh, in this area, not just uh, uh, Tacoma Station, but maybe uh, a little bit further south to... Uh, uh, Fort Totten and up the line to Silver Spring. Uh, how many are, are they giving out? Uh, and would those individuals who get these things, which are not for serious crimes, but, but be, can be minor crimes that foretell uh, a propensity maybe to do uh, more serious things later on, and working with that population might be uh, useful for you. Uh, the other a uh, bit of advice that I'll uh, leave you with and then also a condition for my further support is I think when you came before us uh, at the very beginning, I suggested very strongly that you talk to the C-SAFE people. And 
when Mary was here on the night of uh, Ronnie's introduction, I asked her about this, and she said, no, there hadn't been any formal contact made to her in the program, but you did exchange business cards that evening. So uh, what I will suggest very strongly to you this time is that you meet regularly with her, because even though, as Terry pointed out, it is a different model, uh, there are similarities. There's a lot of knowledge and intelligence that's been de developed over years, and there are many similarities between the kinds of things that the CSAFE program has learned and what you are learning and what both of you can be better if you share that uh, information and that learning. So I will uh, place a condition on my further support and release of the additional money, and that is that you formally meet together uh, for your own benefit um, at least once a month to share information and uh, knowledge. And, and with that uh, condition, uh, I'm happy to support the uh, release of the additional funds, but we'll also suggest strongly to, in this time of uh, very tight budgets that even though I think these investments are important, crucial, and in the long run are very cost effective, um, it, it would be wise, as you are doing, to and move as quickly as possible towards uh, self-sufficiency in the form of other grants and uh, income for the program. Thank you. If I can just follow up on your point toward the end there about, the, uh, about your condition for the release. My sense was that what we need to do tonight is to give the city manager uh, our, our approval or our disapproval of disbursement of the remainder of the funds uh, and I think they heard your condition but I think it, at this point it would be a promise to do that not a condition because we need, we need to kind of move on that tonight and the sense I get from the group is that uh, we direct the city manager to uh, go ahead and disperse the remaining funds the other uh, piece of that that I hear from my colleagues is that uh, that dispersal will generally bring to an end the dispersal of funds and uh, then wish you good luck in going from there and uh, gaining additional funding. I certainly would entertain uh, additional proposals as I would from any other group, but I uh, would just set the level of expectation that uh, It'll probably be a higher hurdle for anything additional. I'll, I'll point out that uh, Chief Percucci is our grant monitor so far as the City of Tacoma Park is concerned. Uh, he has given the responsibility by delegated by the Council to uh, approve our expenditures and supervise our uh, progress. Uh, we're, we're aiming to meet with him uh, on a monthly basis. I think we've done okay. Ronnie even sends her weekly management reports to him at his request. And he, he's your instrument to make sure that we do things like meet with CSAFE. Uh, be, you know, you should tell us, uh, yeah, we'll do that. I, I can promise that. But uh, you, you do have a mechanism for guiding our, our operations uh, until the termination of the memorandum of understanding. And just to add, I saw Mary Saturday at the um, Governor's Crime Prevention uh, Summit, and she and I were actually talking and bouncing ideas back and forth on different things that we could possibly do together. So that's going to happen. Um, I, I'm with Terry in that I'd entertain other um, requests, but not necessarily commit to them now. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one remaining item, which is discussion of ordinance amending the uh, code to revise the stormwater review fee and permit fee. We've uh, worked on this a couple of times already, and my feeling is that we can probably uh, do what we need to do for tonight in fairly short order, uh, and then we can uh, adjourn to go upstairs and uh, discuss things with the city attorney. So welcome back to the table for, what, item number three or four tonight? Yes, yes, yes. Um, we actually, I was in front of you in September to um, look at a first reading uh, draft ordinance uh, amending the fee structure. And if you recall in, in our
cover sheet covers this. Um, uh, in looking at the stormwater code, it was missing fees for um, uh, institutional, commercial, and industrial uh, stormwater permits. It was um, it's just got deleted from a previous draft of the ordinance, I, I imagine, years ago. Uh, so we were uh, successful in, in April and then made effective in May to add the fee structure oh, uh, from what we proposed based on what were the existing uh, fee structures and the rest of the ordinance. What we discovered over the summer for, from a variety of applications was that our fee structure was not in line with the uh, surrounding jurisdictions, primarily Rockville, Gaithersburg, and Montgomery <coughs> County. You have before you tonight the same chart that I presented uh, back, then, uh, back then in September when we proposed amending our fee structure. We've added a couple of other examples. And, and again, these are all real live examples of permits that have actually come through our office and, and uh, facilities that are in the works. Um, what uh, became apparent to us is that the uh, proposed or the fee structure that we created in April and May uh, resulted in, in some cases, much higher costs uh, for permit fees for construction projects, and in other cases, much lower costs. It was kind of an apples and oranges comparison. Um, the proposal that I brought before you in September was basically trying to amend our existing fee structure, putting some minimum and some maximum um, uh, ends on it so as to keep it more in, in line with the uh, surrounding jurisdictions. In further discussions with the city engineer, what we discovered is we, we were never going to get in, in a system that really was um, reflective of all of the, uh, the surrounding jurisdictions' fees. And so we took a hard look at what Gaithersburg and Rockville were doing. Uh, basically, as I presented back in September, their fee structure for permits, and this is not review or anything else, but for stormwater permits themselves, was a percentage, 10 percent, of the actual stormwater uh, construction costs themselves. And that's a, 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 the cost estimate is created by the engineers that design the system. It's a number that they're coming up with for their client anyway, so it's not a difficult piece of information to get. Uh, of course, it's not a, a receipt or a reimbursement. It's just an estimate of the cost proposal based on their, their experience and their expertise. Um, our concern with that at the time in September was we were a little bit worried that that would create a disincentive for um, commercial or institutional or industrial facilities within the city from going beyond the strict um, letter of law. And in fact, what we're trying to do is encourage uh, innovative thinking in stormwater management. Uh, so what the city engineer went back and started, started working with was an idea where we would uh, replicate the model of permit fee structures that Rockville and Gaithersburg have, but we would add a little Tacoma Park twist and try to create a way to provide an incentive for uh, those permittees that felt they were able to, based on the site constraints and their own budgets, um, to enhance and enlarge their uh, stormwater provisions by exceeding our code language. So what we brought before you tonight and why we're doing this in work session discussion is because we had sort of started down one path discovered that it really wasn't get us, get us where we wanted to go, and we've sort of regrouped, and now we're presenting to you a, uh, an additional option for your consideration. And so uh, what you see in front, uh, on that back sheet, if you, if you take a look at each of the four examples, is a, a cost estimate of the permit fees in our current code and a cost estimate of the fees as we propose in the, in the changed code. And again, it's, it's very much in line with the uh, surrounding jurisdictions because it mirrors their process. The piece that we've added to it uh, is to provide the ability for an applicant to get up to 50% of the permit fees, which, and we're talking some significant money in some of these cases, um, return to them uh, if they exceed our code requirements. Uh, I wanted to just say a little bit, and I know that the hour is late, and this is more detail than anybody can absorb in one time, but our uh, design criteria, our permit criteria within our stormwater management code is dictated by the state of Maryland. We use their design uh, manual, and our code itself is created around the model code that the state had, had um, recommended. So our stormwater code mirrors the state's model. Um, the design criteria within the code are those that match the state model. Uh, and they, they list out 
variety of methods and means to reach um, the stormwater controls that are required by our permit standards. Some are structural, some are non-structural. Basically what we're going to try to uh, propose is a fee structure that keeps us in line with the surrounding jurisdictions but also adds uh, the ability for the city engineer in reviewing a case-by-case -case application to say uh, not only have you met our design criteria uh, but you've exceeded it because you're going to put on a green roof or you're going to have porous pavement in your parking lot or you're going to do some type of infiltration that's above and beyond uh, the code because they want to enhance their project, they want to uh, advertise their green feature, they want to do the most they can do um, and then we'll be able to work with them to, to rebate up to 50% of that permit fee uh, to, in, to encourage and, and enhance uh, what we're actually getting on the, on the back end of that once the facility is constructed, once all the pipes and stones and bricks are in place, we want to make sure that what we have is not just compliant with the law but to greatest extent exceeding that so that we'll have better water quality uh, from the stormwater aspect in the end of that. Sounds like a good approach. Comments? That's what we're seeing. Thank you. Um, this last week I had the uh, pleasure of attending a Maryland Municipal League meeting. Uh, and a guest at the meeting was the Secretary of Environment from the state of Maryland, whose name I forget at the moment. Uh, but he was very complimentary of Tacoma Park and our stormwater uh, management and our work uh, to do better and he held us up as an example of what he wished that all communities in Maryland would adhere to and yet recognize that uh, that we too have room for improvement uh, but I, again I'd like to uh, pass that compliment along to you because uh, you've been managing that program for some time and, okay. and so we thank you um, I uh, as far as the plans I, uh, I think it's uh, it's good. We obviously need to make some changes here, and I uh, look forward to hearing more suggestions from the council on, uh, on where we go, because I haven't formed an opinion. Councilmember Wright. I, I just wanted to say thank you, because I think, you know, we have gone back and forth on this a bit, but <clears throat> I personally really appreciate um, you and the staff listening to that and uh, having a healthy debate with us, and I think getting to a place that uh, I think is really good and I'm encouraged by and very supportive of. So. Councilor Clay. Yeah, I also just want to thank you for going back over after you've done all the initial work and, and coming back with a, another solution. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Councilor Robinson. Um, Daryl, did you say that the um, up to 50 percent reduction was a recent addition to mm -hmm. this? Okay. And, um, did you find that model in other places, or did you uh, come up with that on your own? Uh, I, I have to uh, hand that off to Ali. I think the city engineer uh, developed that that uh -huh. uh, proposal. He may have seen it in other places that I'm not aware of. Uh -huh. There certainly isn't anywhere else in Maryland that, that we're aware of that's going on, or in Northern Virginia. But it may be happening other places in the country. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, the enterprise zones in, in Maryland are a way to... Uh, encourage building where the state wants that building mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. and there's a provision in there that uh, you can get a parking waiver up to 50%. Mm -hmm. So in, in that, in a sense, it's similar to that. It's mm -hmm. rewarding things that you want, mm -hmm. and uh, I personally like that as a general um, approach in government and rewarding the things you want and, and uh, penalizing the things you don't want. And in mm -hmm. a sense, that's what we ought to be taxing people on is things we don't want. So I, I commend you on that, and thanks to Allie. It sounds like you've come up with a winner. Well, just one brief question I have, if I may, is um, we have sent this over to the city attorney's office to review. We did get comments back from Linda Perlman today. She was comfortable with this approach, though had some recommendations that we try to um, provide a little bit more of example in our 50% reduction. So I wanted to get a sense of what the council would be feel comfortable in uh, for the ordinance in terms of that language, we've left it fairly um, general 
you know, if the plan stormwater management controls exceed the code requirements, the applicant may be eligible for a deduction of a fee up to 50 percent. If you're comfortable with that or if you need more defining language um, relative to that, um, the city attorney's recommendation was that we provide some examples, i.e., green roof, permeable pavement, you know, some other that, examples. That's what I, I, was didn't know. I, I strongly agree that it needs more specificity there because it's unfair to them. They'll have they'll immediately assume they're getting a 50 percent reduction if you don't put in some uh, examples or a good idea or guidelines. You know, hopefully the technology will improve. So we, we don't know today yeah. what will be available 10 years from now, so we don't want to lock ourselves in. But at the same time, we do want to make sure that it communicates the intention of the council and our goals, um, that it's not a gimme. It's really a, you got to reach a really high bar to get it's, that. Yeah, it seemed to me that I like the idea of examples, but it also gave you some sort of flexibility to um, negotiate with them about what they might put in and mm -hmm. try and encourage or incentivize them to get the behavior you want. Yeah, it's um, putting the decision making where the expertise is, so good. Okay. <coughs> then you've got what you need to bring that back to us? Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. Then we are adjourned.